Thank you. Okay, it being six o'clock, I hereby call to order the regular meeting of the Ojai Planning Commission for Wednesday, June 16th. Uh, Cheryl, could we have a roll call, please? Chair Quillacy? Here. Vice Chair Nolan? Here. Commissioner Lottis? Here. Commissioner Trent? Here. Commissioner Swift? Here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Vice Chair Nolan, would you lead us, please? Yes. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Next is public communications. The time set aside for anyone who wishes to discuss items of interest in the city, city business, other than scheduled agenda items, of which we only have a couple tonight. Is there anyone in the council chamber or virtually who wishes to speak on an item not on the agenda? The agenda consists of a consent item, the minutes of the regular approval of the minutes of the last regular meeting, and the discussion item, the draft housing element update. I want to speak to the draft housing update. Okay, then we'll, we'll wait for public comment on item two. Uh, Cheryl, sounds like there's no one else. We have, excuse me, we have five attendees in the waiting room. If anyone uh, would like to raise their hand uh, to speak at the moment, uh, if you could do that, I would appreciate it. So we do have one speaker for a non-agenda item. Uh, then uh, whoever you are, please uh, identify yourself and uh, please address the commission. Thank you. Oh, it appears uh, she has unraised her hand, so her hand. it may not be. She put her hand down. <laughs> put her hand up, but doesn't want to speak. No, she put her hand down. Oh, okay. Very good. Then, hearing no requests for public communications, we'll move on to the consent item: the minutes of the regular meeting of the Planning Commission, June second. Do any commissioners have any refinements to those meetings? Those minutes, excuse me. No. Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion for approval of the minutes. <clears throat> Vice Chair Nolan. I'll make a motion that we um, accept the minutes from the Ojai Planning Commission June 2nd, 2021 uh, meeting. Very good. Is there a second? Second. Very good, thank you, Commissioner Lottis. Uh, any discussion of the motion? Then Cheryl, would you call the roll, please? Quillacy? Yes. Nolan? Yes. Lottis? Yes. Trent? Yes. And Swift? Yes. Thank you. Thank you all. I was expecting the, <laughs> uh, the Zoom gallery view up here on the screens. Uh, okay, uh, next is our discussion item, the draft 2021 to 2029 housing element update. Uh, Lucas, would you introduce that for us, please? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Chair uh, Quillacy. My name is Lucas Seibert, Community Development Manager with the City of Ojai. The item you have before you tonight for discussion is the draft housing element for the sixth cycle, uh, which will run 2021 through 2029. Um, tonight we have actually Jamie Powers is going to give a presentation um, along with Veronica Tams. I believe she's just wrapping up a meeting um, before uh, coming into this meeting. So she's kind of double, double duty here tonight. So Jamie's going to start it off for us tonight. Um, just as a, a high level, this is a redlined version of the housing element. So there is quite a bit of, of, uh, of redline that has taken place with, for obvious reasons. When you're transitioning from the fifth cycle to the sixth cycle, there's quite a few 
revisions that are made even to the tables um, and to some of the language. I mean, it's been eight years since we've looked at this and made revisions. So you're seeing that reflected throughout the document itself. Um, so with that, I know that Jamie Powers is, is going to be uh, giving a presentation on some high level stuff and then kind of going into um, some of the some of the changes that have taken place from in terms of state law changes from the fifth cycle to the sixth cycle. So with that, Jamie, if you have a PowerPoint for tonight. Yes, let me just pull that up. And if you can share your screen. Okay, are we seeing this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Yes. Great. Sorry. <laughs> um. Okay. All right. Alrighty, yeah, uh, as Lucas said, my name is Jamie Power with Veronica Tam and Associates. Um, I've been um, working closely with Veronica and Lucas um, to get this housing element done. So um, I know we went through uh, uh, a lot of sort of the basic um, general things uh, uh, about the housing and element, housing element requirements last time, but we're just gonna briefly touch on it again as a, as a just sort of brief reminder. Um, it's one of the seven required elements um, in the general plan, um, sets citywide goals, objectives, and policies for housing, housing conditions and needs within the community. Um, as you know, it has to be updated every eight years and this uh, planning, or this housing element will be due on October 15th with a 120 day grace period. Um, and hope, hopefully soon we'll be getting into the uh, uh, HCD review. This document does have to be reviewed by the state, um, and that usually takes about 60 days. So, um, so uh, the, the purpose of the housing element or is to accommodate uh, the state-designated uh, regional housing needs allocation, or the RENA, um, to increase housing production to meet demand, uh, preserve, preserve the existing affordable housing, and then to, just to generally improve uh, the condition of existing housing if, if that's a problem in jurisdictions. Um, and then uh, facilitate uh, a development of housing for all income levels um, and special needs populations. Um, we'll delve into talking about some of the uh, fair housing as well. Um, uh, there's been a lot of changes recently and a lot more requirements than there have been in the past specifically related to fair housing. So we'll, uh, we'll kind of go through that and um, make that a little bit more clear. Um, yeah, just, just a few uh, uh, <laughs> points to get across. Um, it, we're, the city is not building any housing. Um, the private market's building housing. We are just zoning to ensure that uh, uh, their how. Uh, housing is able to be built um uh funds policies programs incentives um should be used to meet uh the the arena and the city's housing goals and it, and it really just yeah sets the stage for developers but it, it's not the city's responsibility specifically to build the housing that's that's the private market um and then uh, we will get into uh, the arena. So we've had a, uh, 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 the OHI has actually seen a, a pretty big decrease in um, uh, required uh, uh, units since uh, the fifth cycle. Um, this cycle, we uh, have 53 units total, um, 13 very low, nine low, 10 moderate and 21 above moderate. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll get into uh, sort of the strategy of how we're going to address um, meeting that arena. Um, so this is just the, the uh, strategy. Here's the arena up here. Uh, potential ADUs. Uh, SCAG released a, um, a uh, I, I suppose, like an analysis to estimate um, income levels for ADUs. So we're able to, um, based on the past three years of uh, ADUs, we're able to project how many we're going to have over the next eight years. Um, and using that uh, SCAG document, we can also uh, estimate what income category these ADUs will be. So um, we're, projecti we're pro projecting about 120, um, uh, 18 very low, 37 low, and so on. 
Um, the SPL uh, overlay sites are going to be used to fulfill the lower income arena. And then we also have a, 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 a vacant and underutilized sites that will be used to fulfill the um, above moderate arena. Um, and yes, we based on uh, the site selection, the ADUs, we are uh, uh, well above the requirement um, that HCD has uh, uh, <laughs> decided on. Um, this is a map of the uh, SPL overlay sites. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it before. We've sort of discussed them, but this is a more refined version of that. Um, I, I don't have a ton to say about this map specifically, but um, if you want to just take a brief look, we can go back to this if, if you'd like to discuss it in uh, more detail later. But I just wanted to give you a visual representation of what we're working with. Um, um, and then, so these are the uh, programs, um, and uh, a lot of them have been updated. Some of them have not been changed. I just wanted to briefly go through uh, some of the programs and um, what what what's go what's been updated, what's going to change. Um, so so adequate sites for arena monitoring uh, no net loss. Um, uh, this is just going to uh, it's a you got it. Uh, um, excuse me. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, develop a procedure to monitor monitor um, the development of vacant and underutilized uh, arena sites by 2022, and provide uh, information specifically to interested developers, um, and uh, uh, update the zoning code to ensure compliance with AB 1397 and SB 166, which is the adequate sites and no net loss. Um, the general plan update. Uh, uh, did you, say, did you just say 2022? Is that just because that's the deadline for our require our submittal? Yeah, uh, 2022, uh, yes. Okay. Well, the submittal is required by the end of 2021, and you have until 2022 to amend the zoning code to reflect that. <clears throat> um, Luke, Lucas, that's correct, right? You can hop in here if you... Yeah, and I, I would just state, I believe it's actually one of the programs that we have in potentially in place here that that um, not necessarily as a part of the housing element moving forward to that that <clears throat> looming October 15th date. Once that once we get this approved by by city council, that's when we start implementing those programs that you're seeing here um, within this draft uh, housing element. One of those will be br bringing up to speed and up to date our zoning ordinance specific to um, to the housing element and those SPL overlay sites. Thank you, Lucas. Um, uh, program two is the general plan update. We have to ensure consistency of all the general plan elements and um, complete uh, the, uh, the elements to ensure consistency with the housing element also by 2022. Um, and then we have program three, affordable housing covenants, and that's uh, continue to monitor, monitor, monitor the housing inventory and seek opportunities to pursue housing. This one, uh, it has been updated, but there hasn't, a lot of these are updated to reflect um, sort of cha any changes in the city, but not a whole lot of change in some of these programs. Um, uh, and then, okay, so uh, next next uh, program is the ADUs and uh, AB 671, in, uh, it's like you have to update your zone sorting ordinance to incentivize ADUs. We, as I, as I talked about before, we have a goal of 120 uh, ADUs or junior, junior ADUs um, within this eight year period um, and developing a monitoring program um, to reach that goal, to ensure that goal is reached. Um, facilitating affordable housing development, that's going to be continued participation in the county C CDBG program, um, pursuing funding for affordable housing projects and um, promoting uh, uh, housing assistance programs and um, seeking affordable housing opportunities through public outreach. Um, Mortgage assistance, this is going to be uh, just making sure home buyer resources are available on the city's website by 2022. Um, that uh, uh, outreach specifically is something that uh, HCD is um, emphasizing. 
uh, capacity preser preservation. It's going to uh, continue continue to implement the capacity uh, preservation requirement included in the zoning code. And um, th th this hasn't changed um, uh, since the last cycle housing element. Um, the, de the density bonus um, uh, will have to change. There are a few new state uh, 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 laws that well, the zoning we'll have to amend the zoning code to be consistent with that includes AB 1763, which is a density bonus for 100% affordable housing, um, AB 1227, which is the density bonus for student housing, and AB 2345, which increases the maximum allowable density. And uh, again, this this will need to be amended by 2022. Um, next, uh, we have uh, housing for persons with special needs. Um, this is going to be uh, uh, additional state laws that what the zoning code will have to comply with. This is a low barrier navigation center, AB 101. Um, emergency shelters parking, AB uh, 139, and a supportive housing. Um, so that the zoning code again, that's by 2022. Um, re reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities. Um, this is going to be uh, 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 amending uh, the zoning code again to uh, be compliant with uh, uh, um, new state laws. I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember the um, specific one. I, I'll, I can pull it up a little bit later, but I, I'm not remembering the number in this moment. Um, and then the growth manor management ordinance. Um, uh, 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 this is just going to be continuing to implement the uh, provisions of the growth ma management or uh, ordinance to ins uh, ensure all adequate allocation is available for the city's arena. Um, resource constraints, uh, revising the city's environmental guidelines to be consistent with the growth management ordinance. Um, and then design review is going to continue to implement design review uh, process specifically exempting um, ADUs. Um, and then uh, retention for affordable units, continuing to implement the ho housing rehabilitation program, Section 8 rent and, and the Section 8 rental assistance program specifically. Um, there's been no change to the anti-displacement uh, program, um, so the continued implementation of that program. Um, sustainability, again, uh, no change. And... Um, Fair housing. So th this is a consistent with AB 686. This this is uh, sort of uh, one of the major changes that's been made um, to the housing element this cycle. Um, I'm, I, I'm sure you know about the new required uh, section on fair housing. And there's also more stringent requirements in uh, meaningful actions. And uh, most of these uh, actions are uh, we have um, uh, outreach and enforcement. Um, uh, and, and cont continued work with the fair housing provider, which I believe is the HRC in Ohio's case. Um, there's uh, uh, um, actions related to housing mobility. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> Lucas, can you can you remember like, the exact list of the rest of the actions? I can pull it up here. I'm sorry, I'm blanking right now. The fair housing action. The fair housing act. I don't have that information in front of me either. Yeah, I don't have it in front of me right now. I can pull it up um, and we can take a look at it. Um, I'd say I'd say finish the presentation. If we need, we can pull that up for, for discussion purposes as well. Sure. Okay, thank you, Lucas. We can come back to it. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> yep. um, uh, next steps. Um, so city council review will be in August. I'm planning to go to HCD for that 60-day review. Um, August or September, and then we will have adoption hearings in October um, by that October 15th uh, adoption date. Sorry, I know it's a little bit all over the place there, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to clarify. So the, um, so the how I'm so, I, I'm not sure I followed everything, but the sure. so the housing plan. These are steps that the city needs to take to meet all the um, state requ state requirements, basically, correct. for the housing element. Is that correct? Correct. And okay. uh, to sort of facilitate development to meet that, you know, um, whether it's incentive, some of them are maybe in incentives, others are requirements 
um, to it to be in compliance with state law. Okay, and that's so. Um, so, what is the how? How does that uh, relate to the housing action plan? I, I'm just I'm only I'm just a little confused in how this all fits together. All these pieces. Sure. So the programs are the housing action plan. Um, and these are um, essentially goals and requirements over the next eight years that the city must achieve either to meet the arena or to be in compliance with state law. Um, and specifically for the fair housing actions, um, there's not, uh, uh, there's not, um, we're not uh, uh, amending the zoning code specifically to comply with anything, but HCD is really uh, stringent about meaningful actions, um, looking for uh, 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 neighborhoods that may need rehabilitation issues. Um, uh, yeah, but generally, so this is the, these are the actions that the city will be taking over the next eight years. To meet, to meet state law, because I, I still, I guess I'm still a little confused because we have the housing action plan, but that's apparently something, I mean, the housing plan. If I may interrupt, um, this yeah, is for Monica Tam, I'm, I'm available, it's probably available now, and, and I think your just the programs, the housing programs comprise is is your housing action plan, and you have a housing action plan currently under your current housing element. But we're required to update that because there are new state laws and there are changes in in um, market conditions, and and therefore um, we we're updating your plan, your housing action plan for the next eight years. Okay, and actually, the action plan contains that's the policies and goals. So, the goals. housing or no, the housing action plan is the policies and goals, but the housing plan is like a general, more general, more overview of the whole thing. Is that right? No, not really. <laughs> the housing action plan is the goals, policies, and implementing actions. So the programs are the implementing actions. Okay. <clears throat> I had a question. Uh, please go ahead. Oh, I, I wasn't sure if we're just commenting on the PowerPoint presentation and then um, are we going to take public comment and then are, or are we going to be going through the document the way we typically do? Um, is that coming later or is that something we would do now? Yeah, I have, I have questions in a very similar vein. Uh, okay. First, first might be Lucas, is this <laughs> the last time the planning commission will see this hundred page document? It is not. I mean, the, the process with, with the housing element itself as a draft document um, that you're seeing tonight is if the commission is, is okay with the red lines that we're seeing here tonight, um, there can be an action taken and then that action is forwarded to the city council. Um, once that action is taken by city council, then it goes to um, HCD for their review and then they provide their comments. And then it comes back to planning commission. So you'll have a second, a second chance to review. Um, and that will be with the comments from city council, with the comments from HCD, and then you'll be seeing kind of a holistic approach to that and with the environmental document itself as well. Um, but I do have a comment. Can I comment on that also? Please. Excuse um, me, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, Jamie, if you could uh, please stop sharing your screen, I would appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, Chair Quillacy and the commissioners, you know, um, I appreciate all the hard work staff has done on this, but honestly, uh, I, well, I've had an exceptionally busy last three or four days. But I feel that this is a, a very important document 
it's it's pretty big. It's uh, very in depth, and um, I don't. F I feel that, and the commission has a very important role to play in this, in terms mm -hmm. of the review, um, both from a technical and a policy point of view. I think, um, and I I would I I was going to wait, but I I'll just put this out there now, and we can talk about it later, perhaps. But I think that um, to do this justice, to do the review justice, that that we really need at least another meeting. And and uh, I feel that I have not been able to do a sufficient review, um, getting this on Friday for uh, a real, uh, you know, to have time to read it thoroughly, to have time to digest it, and to think about it, and come back with meaningful feedback. I mean, I do have I do have some general. Uh, comments about issues that I think are important, but um, I feel that a, a, a thorough and complete review, really, um, the commission should seriously think about, um, you know, doing what we can do tonight in terms of taking comments and discussion, identification of important issues and so forth, but that we, to allow for um, uh, really an adequate amount of time to review that, that we continue to another meeting. That, that was, I was going to bring it up later, but I'll just put it out there right now. Chair Colosi? Uh, yes, please go ahead. Oh, I, I tend to agree with um, Chair Lottis, or uh, Commissioner Lottis. Um, it would be you know great to get the public comment mm -hmm. and input. And I agree that possibly you know we could go through the document i mean there's some things like just some minor questions that i have or some clarity that needs to happen but kind of maybe do like you know a once over but then depending on the time tonight i agree possibly come back because it is an important element and i'm not sure how much public comment we're going to get but i'm hoping that we have that flexibility and then chair close yeah, you can let us know what the format is tonight uh, and or the consultants as far as when the public comment will happen and then when we can go through the document and start with some input. Okay. Yeah, I, I did not uh, ask my first question precisely enough, I think. Is, is, it, is it the current plan that tonight is the last time the Planning Commission will see this before it goes to HCD? Yes, that's the proposal, and that's that's the recommendation by staff. Okay, tonight. because it's it's a hundred pages. I I have been through it, and I have marks on maybe thirty or forty pages. I don't know yeah. that we can get through all of that tonight. Uh, what I think I would like to do is, if there are some general questions that commissioners have for staff or for the consultants. Then, then let's take that and then let's hear from the public and then we'll get down in the weeds because if this document, if unchanged, is going to last for eight years, it's right. at least as important as a resolution that this, that this commission would pass or an ordinance that the city council would pass. And I think we need to take whatever time is necessary to get through all of that. Uh, so if that, if that general format is acceptable to everybody, then I would ask commissioners if there are general questions that you'd like to hear from staff or from the consultants uh, before we get down into the details of either the administrative report or the draft uh, housing element. Are there any of those, please? I have a question. Uh, please go ahead, Commissioner Lottis. Um, I, I guess originally, our two weeks ago, whenever we were looking at the um, the uh, SPL site, SPL is that what it is? I can never remember that. SPL sites. Um, I guess I was under the impression that we could we were not counting ADUs towards the uh, arena number. But you had a chart up on the presentation that seemed to indicate otherwise. So I just would like to 
uh, be straightened out on, on that. Justin. Yeah, the report says we have we have a conservative estimate of twice as many ADUs, junior ADUs, and conversions, or compliance program ADUs, as we need to meet the RENA numbers for eight years. Then, in addition to that, we have in the report um, sites with purported population densities or dwelling unit densities that that constitutes four times the RENA number or more. Right. Um, so what what really counts is against the RENA number? Yeah, I thought Both? that somebody I thought somebody said the state would not accept ADUs uh, to as a, a component to meeting RENA numbers. No, it's you actually. Want it's, me to answer that? Yeah, Veronica, if you can start, I'll finish with answering that. Okay. Go ahead. Um, uh, you can use ADUs to count towards your regional housing needs allocation. Yes, and but the uh, the issue is that they don't want you that to be your only strategy for meeting your regional housing needs allocation because you still have the obligation to facilitate a variety of housing types for different income groups. And so use, utilizing ADUs as your only strategy would not be appropriate. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That's, that clarifies it. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So a variety of strategies, but both, both sources of housing count against the RENA number. Is that Correct. what we're hearing? I don't want to use the word count against. I would say f help to further our affordable housing requirements. They draw down the number from 53. If, if they existed, they would help us meet the RENA number of 53 additional dwelling units. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, any other questions for staff or the consultants? I, I have one on, on state law, but I'm not sure where to ask about it. Would. State law sounds like that might be in the weeds. We may want to hold that to, to the to the detailed discussion. Yeah. I, that's fine with me. Yeah. Okay. Any other commissioners have questions for staff or for the consultants at this time? Well, maybe I, it might be a question later. I have a question on um, the rules rules or uh, regulations regarding the arena number in terms of um, infrastructure infrastructure exemptions um, is there is there something in the rules that talks about about that when you don't have the infrastructure um actually no um there it, there used to be um that um there is um if you have like severe constraints that um, particular water, then you you wouldn't be obligated to to provide for the housing or, or that your real arena number would be very small. Uh, but now the law has changed. Um, if you are um, if you are constrained in infrastructure, you cannot use those sites. If those sites have constraints on infrastructure, you cannot use those sites to meet your arena. But ultimately, you still have to meet your arena and and possibly put in. You, you're not obligated to build the infrastructure uh, or provide the water, uh, but you need to have a plan how to facilitate the, um, getting more water for the city and then facilitate um, um, infrastructure improvements in the, in the city. And so there, there is this obligation still that you have to facilitate that, the provision of those services. Okay, thank you. I, you know, I think, it, I think a further comment is, is more of a discussion issue with the Planning Commission and possibly with the staff and consultants in terms of just uh, fleshing that out a little bit more but I can wait for that. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Trent, anything that you'd like to ask staff or the uh, consultants at this time? Um, not at this time, no, but I'll have some additional questions as we move through. But thank you. Super. Uh, Commissioner Swift, any questions for staff or the consultant at this time? No, not at this time. Okay. Uh, then 
Uh, Cheryl, let's let's go to public comment and uh, see either our live or our virtual folks that are here that wish to comment. You call them up one by one. Fine. Okay, our first speaker is Bill Miley. Hello. Hi, Bill. When do I start? Now? Okay. For the record, my name is Bill Miley, and my family has lived here since 1968. I would like to acknowledge the immensity of this update document. And I, and I value the, all the energy the folks who are working on it have put in. My specific issues uh, with the draft are, one, the section on resource constraints should be expanded to include sections from the Casitas Municipal Water District Management Plan. There's not enough information about OI water history and the limited water resources. We're one of the driest sections in the, in the southern part of California. And also we should be talking about how we need to support our orchard ranching in order to maintain a moderate climate and a value too. The inventory should include a seven to eight unit two-story building at the corner of Grand and North Signal Street, which was maybe still now owned by the Ventura County Area Housing Agency. That's not on the list. Three. The vacancy rates of 8% look like we have a lot of vacancies, but we don't. If you look at apartment.com, there's hardly anything available. Um, the two, the almost 300 houses or units that are vacant, in my opinion, are mostly second and third homes. So they're not available for rent. For the city needs to continue to place a restricted emphasis on producing units for workforce housing and not necessarily to bring people in who live someplace else and work someplace else. We just don't want to bring more people in. Five, a major constraint that I think is missed in this draft is the air quality factor. I remember it used to be that we could not have one more commute trip through the Conceda Springs Edison curve because the air quality would uh, be affected. Six, Again, on constraints, the water resource capacity should say something like, we don't have any outside water in this valley. We're having increasing droughts and we don't want to actually jeopardize the whole valley by bringing more people in. But I know state law says you can't deny water for affordable housing. Seven, we need to place an emphasis on encouraging rentals with reduced parking spaces or rentals that have no parking. And eight, our challenge is not to place them all in one spot. We don't want to put them all on three acres where we have 60 to 70 units. In my opinion, and people in the past in this community have said, we need to sprinkle affordable housing units throughout our city. Units that have maybe six to 10 Time. mixed income rentals available. And that would be good. That's the end. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Um, I I uh, was interested in your comment about sprinkling uh, affordable housing clusters, if you will, here and there in the city. How would you feel about a cluster up on North Signal Street? Sure. Is we have there, a lot of property. Is there, there room for such a thing? There is on the, probably on the north side. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, for excuse me, on the east side. Okay, thank you for your comments. Cheryl, who's next? Next, we have Douglas Weber. Mr. Weber, if you can unmute yourself, you may speak. Just so yes, good evening. You Do you hear me all right? Yes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, compared to the previous speaker, we are very recent arrivals to Ojai, but we lived in a small, uh, very rural area in the North Cascades of Washington for almost 30 years. 
So we're very concerned with uh, water. And, but the housing, obviously, that's not on the agenda for tonight. The housing uh, element is, is crucial. And uh, I would just second the uh, concerns of, uh, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Catherine Lotties, to take as much time as you need to review this. It sounds like you only got it Friday and it's Wednesday. So uh, we're new arrivals. We're trying to learn what the uh, city's goals are and they seem to be admirable and we like the small town feeling so appreciate the opportunity to just weigh in and hopefully we'll see you folks in person next time that's it thank you thank you for your comments sir uh, cheryl who's up next next we have marshall hines Mr. Hines, if you could please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sorry, I was just hoping to sort of sit in and listen. I didn't have any comments. My apologies. Oh, well, that's fine. Thank you. Appreciate your being here to listen. Cheryl, who's next? Next, we have Michelle Wells. Ms. Wells, if you can unmute yourself, you may speak. Hi. Uh, thank you, Cheryl. I was really just listening. So thanks for the chance. I, I didn't have any comments. Okay. That's fine. I appreciate the, uh, the level of interest among the public, even just to listen to the proceedings tonight. Thank you. Cheryl. Next speaker is Mona Burt. Ms. Bird, if you can unmute yourself, please. You may speak. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I really don't understand um, a lot of this stuff. Um, I was born and raised here in Ojai, and um, I just, I, I'm not understanding this, and I'm not understanding why the people that were, that have been here for so long can't get housing. And um, so if anybody can, Kind of let me know like what what this is supposed to do and is this like supposed to take eight years to do i i have no idea what what this is and um and like i said i just know that there's a lot of us having problems with housing right now um and so maybe someone can explain that for me Okay. Mona, is that the end of your comments? If you, yes. if, if not, I can respond to that. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Kind of at a 20,000 foot level. And Veronica, you can step in here too as well. But the housing element itself is really meant to provide for the opportunity for um, affordable housing uh, throughout the city. And that's done in a, a bunch of different ways. State law over the last eight years has, has really changed drastically in terms of how ADUs, for instance, can be implemented within the cities. I can tell you 20 years ago, uh, they were requiring a, a conditional use permit for almost every city, and if not basically prohibiting through a CUP process, um, up to a CUP process for ADUs. That has changed drastically. That's one very good example where you're seeing housing being placed within single family, predominantly single family neighborhoods. Um, the overlay aspect that was being discussed um, earlier, it's the term itself is being referred to as SPL overlay. That is a, a type of a zoning or a planning um, tool that's used to help to provide for the opportunity for affordable housing. Um, cities are not required to or even obligated to um, develop those sites, but it provides for those nonprofits or developers themselves to come in and um, provide for that housing. Uh, and really what, what, this, what happens is every eight years, that's when we're talking about like a fifth cycle transitioning to the sixth cycle. That's really from the very beginning of which um, state law started the, the whole housing element requirement through a bigger document referred to as the general plan. So I hope that answers your questions, Mona. If not, um, 
I can certainly talk to you offline more about, about this because there's a lot that goes into this. I know we're talking kind of partially at a, a high level, but if you're listening in, we'll certainly get into the weeds at some point tonight as well. Yeah, if I could throw in a, a comment, my understanding of the SPL overlay is that it is uh, in a way an additional entitlement on each individual parcel. It does not require the city and it does not require the owner of the parcel to develop the parcel with affordable housing, but it allows for it independent of the base zoning of the parcel. And so what the city is, is obligated to do here is to provide processes and procedures which could include adding an SPL overlay to a particular parcel to allow for the possibility of developing affordable housing in sufficient numbers to meet the RENA requirements. Is that about? Yeah, the entitlement piece is something I didn't mention, but yes, it does provide for an entitlement for the opportunity. But so like- Entitlement, not a requirement. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Cheryl, do we have another virtual visitor? We do, we have Meg Goodwin. And I just received a message that says, Meg Goodwin is using an older version of Zoom. So I will promote her to a panelist. Okay. Working in progress. Oh, okay. Oh, hi. Thank you. Um, oh. Sorry about my weird Zoom. I'm, so I just wanted to um, say that it looks good. I agree with Bill Miley about the weirdly high vacancy rate. Is that because of second homes that are unoccupied or what that is? But also if we could sort of encourage some of these people that have guest houses to at least add them to the rental stock, you know, that could be a add some homes. But also I just want to reiterate, I'm hoping to have our my block of North Montgomery Street rezoned from commercial C1 to um, village mixed use because that would add a couple of housing units right there that are unable to be rented right now because they're strictly commercial. So, um, and we would love it because we're surrounded by village mixed use here. But, and I would just like to in general encourage more village mixed use. I know in this housing plan it mentioned uh, height restrictions and all that. I agree they probably shouldn't be over 40 feet or whatever so anyway I think you guys are doing a good job it's really a difficult project trying to get more housing in this tiny town I was also wondering it didn't list any motor home uh, like the mobile home parks it said we had zero units are those considered in the housing element and uh, that was just what I was wondering about the trailer parks and that's about the end of my comments Okay, Lucas, would you care to respond to that? And I, I default that to Veronica. Veronica, do we, does the state allow for mobile home parks to be counted towards affordable housing? Is she muted? You know, my understanding from a Veronica, recent you, but not you detailed are reading of the of the code mobile home parks are not currently allowed in the city but mobile homes if they are manufactured housing are part of residential development under government code 65008 f2 mm -hmm. they're part of manufactured housing which is part of residential development so i'm not sure whether mobile homes on foundations are allowed in the city or not and so i'm, I'm to, wondering maybe nikhil can address that just to just to clarify that before nikhil jumps in within our use chart itself uh mobile home parks are allowed through the approval of a conditional use permit and that's within our okay um, residential zones oh but they have to be at least 20 acres or something like that there's limitations to that but just understand through a cup process um, okay. In a practical sense, they're not allowed at the moment. I don't think we have any 20-acre parcels in the city. 
So uh, I'll, I'll respond to that. So okay. the, the code doesn't explicitly ban or limit mobile homes other than what's in the code. Any mobile home would have to go through a CUP process. And so at, the, at present, I believe there are no mobile homes in the city and there are no sites that could qualify for mobile homes, but that's not, that doesn't mean that the mobile homes are banned in the city. Okay. Or no sites that would qualify for a CUP for sure. a mobile home park. Right. It's not to say that sites couldn't necessarily be merged together to reach that, that qualifying feature. But there's no, there's no explicit ban or an, an, on mobile homes. Yeah. Okay. It's just, it's a, it's a practical ban for, for lack of available space or, or other regulations. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a ban. I would, okay. I would say that it's a... The, the regulatory framework as written doesn't necessarily allow for a mobile home to exist in the city right now, but that may change if, like Lucas said, parcels are merged. Yeah. Yes. Okay. But there's no policy be banning mobile homes. All right. Uh, Cheryl, do we have some more virtual visitors? We have one more speaker in the waiting room. Uh, his name is Thomas Thine. Mr. Thine? Oh, hi, everyone. I, I just signed up just to be here and to listen and to support. Um, so I'm not sure how I ended up on that list, but I'm very happy to be here. And I really appreciate you all doing this. This is great. Uh, go. Oh, hi. Okay. Glad to have you here listening. Uh, Cheryl, who's who's here with us live tonight? Uh, please step up, sir. Identify yourself and address the commission. Thank you. And, uh, Ted Moore, can you hear me clearly, everyone, with my mask on? I just want to make yes. sure. Okay. Um, hi, I've lived here since, uh, well, it's been about 31 years, okay? I'm, I am a developer. Um, I wanted to speak about the 14-acre property that's across from Nordoff High School. And I know you considered putting the SPL overlay zone on. I had requested that you do that and consider it. Uh, my understanding is one of the reasons that came up that you couldn't do it is it's more than 10 acres, which I'm quite willing to lower my request to less than 10 acres, you know, or say 7 to 10 acres. Uh, likely it'll wind up being a mixed-use residential project for d different housing types, um, which is, I think, the proper way to do it. But um, I would like to say, though, that I do have an offer to develop the whole property, to buy it and develop it, you know, with me from people's self-help housing. So. They are here, they're real, okay? Um, so what I really was asking tonight is that you reconsider the 14 acres. And, and here's the reason why. Th this is an unusual situation where I'm really tying together, not just that 40, 14 acres, but I've also been invited and I've joined the, the Nordoff High School Master Planning. Um, I've always been very involved uh, trying to help out with the school board, school district, I should say, on their downtown, that 7.75 acre parcel as well, okay? I really see these, these three properties um, integrated in different ways. And I see a much greater benefit to the community in just trying to come up with additional SPL zoning and overlay, okay? And so really what I'm asking you to do is to take a look at something that provides additional benefits to the community, uh, certainly to the school district and uh, to individuals in this community. And I'm just gonna go through those quickly with you um, by the way, people self-housing have often told me that the minimum size project they want to do is 40 units, okay? It is difficult to do these projects, very difficult. And you have to go through, um, you know, tax credit procedure, and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a beauty contest, if you will. And uh, it's difficult to get approved for these 9% tax credits, right? So... In speaking with, you know, Tiffany Morris, who invited me on to this master um, planning committee of the high school, and we had the first meeting, or at least the one I, first one I attended was last week. And I was trying to get an understanding of where they were, what, um, what issues they had, and where I might be able to help, okay? And so one of the things that popped up for me, and I just put out there, is that um, they have certain events such as you know, graduation, um, you know, track meets, uh, Friday night football, 4th of July, and now they're gonna have a public pool, okay? So I think there's a need for community parking, overflow parking. And 
what I suggested to them, I said, look, I can put that parking field in for you, maybe an additional 100 spaces, I was thinking. And uh, it would be no cost to the school district. And the obvious trade-off for me, and how the only way I could really afford that is if I can do a project on the property, okay? Sure. That's, that's kind of the bottom line. So um, the other thing that can happen with, say, their downtown property, and I've been kind of an informal advisor to the school district for many years just because I've developed a lot of commercial real estate throughout California, okay? I did, but the only thing I've done here in Hohai, by the way, is that um, small office park on Bryant Circle. You know, there's like eight small buildings there. So I did that many, many years ago. So um, one of the things I know they have to do, because I took a look at, um, I actually was one of the applicants to try to get that property to develop it myself. Um, they chose somebody else um, for now. I don't think they've made their final decisions on what they're going to do. But I know one of the things that they had to resolve was where to put the district offices. And what I suggested to, um, to the committee when I was listening to it, I said I could, or actually to Tiffany, that I could actually put the district office again on that 14 acres across the street and be part of the mix. I think, I think the problem with that parcel right now is that it's a single parcel over yeah, but 10 it could acres. Be, it could be and we've, we've been assured by a city council member that the city council will not approve a recommendation to put the SPL overlay on that. Well, um, and I, I'm, I would I would have to ask uh, Lucas if if Mr. Moore decided to develop the property anyway under its current zoning. Uh, it seems to me that he couldn't put nearly as many dwelling acres on it as if he had the SPL overlay. Is that right? So yeah, it's zoned single family. So it would be one unit per acre. So 14 houses. Or 14 houses. Yeah. Which, so, is really, which, which is really. And that's hard to pencil out, I understand. Well, it makes no sense yeah. whatsoever. And it's, um, it, unfortunately, but yeah. if I could just say, it's very simple to do, you know, lot splits and, and reduce it. And it has to be done anyway. If, if, so you were, if you were to go through subdividing that 14 acres, I suspect you could come back and and talk to the city about putting the SPL overlay on, even though it would be out of cycle. I think we could, the city could still do that and allow development, even though it's not on the current housing element list. Is that right? That's correct. There's a process. I I had walked through that a couple of meetings ago. Okay. In terms of it going to planning commission because it's a legislative action. You're yeah, changing okay. the general plan as well as more than likely changing the zoning on it as well, depending on what, what you would be looking at. But so it, it, I, yeah. I would also like just to preface this with, we had the same discussion two weeks ago and when we had that discussion, um, I know there were a lot of different scenarios that played out. We were looking at this site, we were looking at a couple other sites. The reality is, is that we're looking at the, the site as it currently exists, right. not the formality of what could be, but what is currently on that site. Yeah, yeah. So, Mr. Moore, if you, if you want to, on, uh, at your own convenience, get with Lucas and, and or Nikhil and say, what hoops do I have to jump through to be able to do SPL-like stuff on all or part of this property, I'm sure they can, they can give you chapter and verse about how to get there. It just won't be something that counts against this cycle's RENA numbers but it's still doable. It just requires actions by you and by the city is my understanding, right? Just, just a, a comment on that. Um, and you could be absolutely right. So maybe this needs to be looked at because I think it has such broad opportunities for the No community. question. I, I've yeah. heard rumors that the, that the school board has other designs on the property or part of the property and you can take all of that into account and, and come to Lucas and say, how do we make this work? And he'll tell you how to make it work. I, I would just like to add one final piece on water because that was brought up by one of the virtual guests. Yep. Um, uh, it, it, the, the, the intention and it is possible to make it as a water neutral project. That is a challenge, but um, the school district um, there are may ways that I can work with the school district to like replace showers, toilets, maybe irrigation systems, maybe artificial turf. I've heard it was done over in Miners Oaks or Miramati, so yeah, yeah, certainly possible. So, and I, I know a great deal about the water in this valley. I mean, I know 
There's an extremely good well site, for example, that runs right through the ball fields of the high school. And um, you can get an exemption. I already checked with the county, planning work, so I checked with uh, Matt Laver, actually. Um, would he support it, um, taking the well moratorium off if we could um, drill a successful well that would supply water to the school and to, yeah, to this if property? The, if the moratorium on water wells ends, there, there could be a lot of possibilities. Right. Okay. Thank you very much for your comments, sir. Okay. So just, just I'm sorry, one final piece. I like to come back. I'll talk to Lucas, but then I'll kind of come back with a kind of a written narrative, if you will, and even a plan to show what uh, I have in mind. Okay. Love to hear from you at a future meeting. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Lucas. And, uh, sir, did you intend to speak this evening? No, I'm here to listen. Just to listen. Okay. Have we, have we run out of public comments then, Cheryl? All right. Then I will uh, close that and uh, come back to just the commission questions of a more detailed nature and, and uh, general discussion of the document itself. Uh, as I say, I've got, I've, got, I've got writing on 30 or 40 of the 100 pages and uh, not clear to me that we can get through it all tonight. Um, my first question, uh, this would be for, for Lucas, uh, perhaps for the, for the uh, consultants as well. You talk about an October 15th deadline for submitting a plan to HCD and penalties if we have not implemented this plan or this new housing element within 120 days. What is your experience with HCD's responsiveness in reviewing things? Or is there something automatic that says if we don't hear back from them in 60 days, then we can assume they have approved what we gave them. I'm, I'm concerned about getting caught in that, in that squeeze between them reviewing it and us having to pass something legislatively. Um, just, oh, Lucas, do you want me to answer that? Yeah, I was going to point to you, Veronica, for the first part of that answer. I, I, yeah. Um, the, the point is to adopt the housing element, not to implement the housing element. Um, that you have eight years to to uh, implement the housing element. So by October 15 or within 120 days of October 15, we have to adopt the housing element, which kind of sets your your commitment for the next eight years. Um, and you are right; the time frame is very tight. And um, despite you know all the challenges that we're facing with COVID and everything um, recently, um, we we were not able to get in the state to extend the housing element deadline more. Uh, what they are obligated to do is that when we submit the draft housing element to them, um, they have sixty days to review the draft housing element, and. Um, at the typically at the end of the 30 day review, they'll come back to us with preliminary comments. Um, and that would give us maybe a, a little bit of time to review the comments and maybe we make revisions. At the end of the 60 days, they will be um, they are obligated by by law to give us a comment letter. What are the comments or remaining comments that they have on our draft housing element? Um, at that time, you have the choice to um, to do another round of 60 day review if you have the time to do that and make more revisions or you go ahead and adopt the housing element um, and making the revisions responding to the comments and but go ahead and adopt the housing element and submit it to them. They have a, a, a second round of they have a second stage of review of ad, uh, reviewing your adopted housing element and they have 90 days to do that. So what we, what we have to do is adopt within 120 days from the October 15, the adoption, um, if we adopt by that timeline, it would avoid us the penalty of, of having to update the housing element more frequently. If you miss the deadline, you will have to update the housing element every four years. But if you, you meet the de adoption deadline, then your housing element is eight years. Now, once you, you've met that timeline, we have more time to actually 
we work the housing element if necessary to meet state law. So you can still continue to work with them and, and to negotiate policies um, as necessary to meet state law. But the important thing is um, what is required to happen within 120 days of October 15 is you submit a draft housing element, you um, complete a 60 day review of the draft housing element, you get a common letter from them and you adopt within that time frame. That's the legal obligation. We can continue to revise the housing element and work with them until we get a certification afterwards. But um, but the deadline uh, for the October 15 and the grace period is adoption. I'm not sure that I completely understand. Let me throw <laughs> no, out a scenario. Complex. The uh, process, yes. Does, does uh, it, it sounds to me like HCD is going to have the same 30 day period from October 15th to November 14th to review updated housing elements from every city in the state? Correct. What is your experience with them? Can they do that? And if they don't do that, is the city free to adopt the housing element as submitted and then make changes in response to their comments whenever those come in? Um, the HCD hired up significantly for this round of the housing element update. There are probably about 12 to 15 um, new members of the reviewer, so they're anticipating that. Uh, but I do see a challenge that HCD may or may not be may not be able to really like, do a, a um, thorough review and and give us the time that we need to revise the housing element. And so that's exactly what you just mentioned. If you adopt on time, it doesn't mean that you're automatically approved. There is no automatic approval. The only thing that we need to do, make sure that we do is adopt on time within October 15 is the statutory deadline. The drop that day is 120 days from that. And so that's February 12, 2022. So if you adopt within that time frame, even though it may not be quote unquote certifiable at that time, um, we can still adopt and meet the timeline and be able to lock in the housing element for an eight year time frame. But but your housing element is not fully approved by the state yet. So you want to, you have to continue to work with the state to make sure that you you get the final approval. So if there, if there were no comments that came back from HCD as a result of the October 15th submission, city council could approve whatever we have in front of us and then continue discussions with the state without incurring these penalties of having to do a housing element every four years and work toward complete compliance whenever we find out what HCD wants changed. Is that? Yes. Um, I, however, I've written um, more than 100 housing elements in my career. I've only gotten two that, that comes back from HCD with no comments. Um, and, and so you will get comments. Um, and I think the, the only difficulty would be how much time do they afford us to make revisions. Okay. So, but just like you suggested, once we adopt on time, then we will afford the penalty of four year housing element. But then it also means that we will have to come back and, and we work the housing element um, to achieve certification, ultimate certification. Because you do, you know, I, I assume that would be the city's goal because of the, 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 the legal, you know, risk that we had mentioned before in the last meeting. Okay, so uh, there, there are really two critical deadlines. Well, one of which has a date on it, October 15th, submitting an updated housing element to HCD. The other deadline, which does not have a date on it, is getting certified or approved or whatever the appropriate word is right. by HCD. Correct. And that could that could take who knows how long. Is that? Oh, 
That that is correct. But um, the October fifteen is the statutory deadline for adoption. Right. But but you do for have a submission. Break- Not submission. Submitting the draft housing element to HCD, you have to first submit the draft housing element to HCD for the 60 day mm-hmm. review. Then you can go to adoption. You, you sub- cannot you submit adopt a, a draft to HCD without adopting it. The submission has to be by October 15th. No. Then the adoption, adoption has to be within 120 days without regard to what HCD may have to say about the draft? Um, the bottom line is you have to submit a draft housing element to HCD for review before you can adopt. And the HCD review is 60 days. So if you want to adopt by February 12th, you back up at least 60 days for HCD review. That's, you know, that's how late you can submit your draft housing element. Um, but you cannot adopt a housing element without first considering HCD comments, which can only happen after the HCD 60 day review. Which is, which is the reason why it's referred to as a draft as we take it to HCD, because really they're the ones that are grading proverbially the, the paper that we have produced or the document that has been produced up to this point hoping that every single line item that was discussed and identified within that PowerPoint, um, and certainly within this revised and redlined version that we're seeing here tonight, is addressing all the state laws that have come forward um, over the last eight years. In terms well, of there's, there's a lot of it that says, we will in fact change ordinances and change the code, et cetera, et cetera, to comply with state law during the next eight years. Correct, and that's the, that's the programs that we have in place. Yeah. That's a part of the program. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, I do have one other question. I, I guess this is for the consultants. Uh, two, two, frankly, um, the the section on affirmatively furthering fair housing (AFFH) it's covered in the admin report on page four, but it specifically calls out Government Code six five zero zero eight. And when I read 65008A and 65008A3 taken together, it says to me, any action pursuant to this title by any city, county, city and county, or other local government agency in this state is null and void if it denies to any individual or group of individuals the enjoyment of residence, land ownership, tenancy, or any other land use in this state because of the intended occupancy of any residential development by persons or families of very low, low, moderate, or middle income. Now, I'm I'm a simple person. I try to read the plain language of the law. And that says to me that if someone with more than middle income or more than moderate income could sue the city if they wanted to live in a project developed for persons or families of very low, low, moderate, or middle income. But if they were excluded because of having too much income, then aren't we, by designating parcels and developments for lower or moderate income, are we not violating 65008? Um, the affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, requirement is actually referred, like, you know, they're adopting by reference um, to the federal requirement that unfortunately was repealed, and, and but California continues with that. What we have to do in, you, you currently, the city has fair housing laws. Um, the state of California and the federal government has fair housing laws. The cities are not typically in charge of enforcing fair housing laws, but you have to um, you have to proactively further fair housing choice. 
In the housing element, that's not what we're looking at. In the context of the housing element, um, in the AFFH analysis, that's not what we're looking at. Um, um, we have a, um, um, this is a brand new requirement, and and so far. Um, there's only been one jurisdiction that's um, gotten this component of the housing element done, um, approved by the state, and that is done by us. Um, and we were told by the state that they are using our analysis as a sample for the state to other jurisdictions in the state, how to do this analysis. The focus is not on how individuals are being um, um, treated in the in the housing market because we we don't have control over that um, the housing element from the AFFS perspective is is your policies and programs um, provide variety of housing choices um, is it um, are you doing what you can to um, outreach and 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 um, uh, educate the public about fair housing uh, requirements um, but that's the problem. That's the reason why you we HCD doesn't like you to just use ADUs. They, they doesn't like jurisdictions to just use ADUs to meet the, the arena because you have to provide a variety of housing types to meet the diverse housing needs in your community. Now, um, it, we have also talked about the arena being a planning goal, not a production requirement. You're only doing planning for the arena from a um, from a land use and zoning perspective that this kind of density can potentially facilitate the development of in, you know different types of housing that would be suitable for different income groups. You're not required to build any units for any income groups. So there is not any. I don't see any conflict in there, but certainly from the housing element perspective, the AFFH that the state is looking for is really, have you provided a variety of housing choices? Have you um, looked at your resources in your community that you or, or your plans in the future to increase the, um, to, to enhance the neighborhood conditions in areas that may be low or moderate income right now, uh, do you have plans to promote out outreach and education? That's that's the lens of AFFH um, for the housing element. I surrender. Uh, one last question. The, the last paragraph of the staff report says, the preparation of an addendum to the environmental document will be necessary. Are the consultants doing that? If so, what is in it? What is what is necessary to add to the last cycle's environmental document? Right, so that will not be done by Veronica Taman Associates. That would be done by the environmental consultant that's a subconsultant of uh, Ramey and Associates. Remember, Ramey and Associates is doing the general the general plan update. Okay. And then they have they have an environmental consultant um, working on it. The name is escaping me currently but we have sent that off to them for, re for revisions to the EIR that was adopted for the fifth cycle. And they're looking at um, what revisions are necessary to bring it up to date, meaning technical reports that will need to be done to, to bring it up to, to date, correct? So it could be something as straightforward as changing all the statistics in the tables? Yes. But, okay. But those, that analysis will need to be done. But because it's, it, is a, it is an update and a project under CEQA, there has to be some sort of environmental doc and, uh, to, for the sixth cycle. And that'll, ha that'll be approved by council. Will the planning commission see the environmental document before it goes to council? Yes. Uh, do we have a, an expected timeline for that? Currently working with them on what that timeline looks like, yes. Okay but it's certainly not tonight. It might be two weeks from now or three weeks from now. It might be five weeks from now. Correct. I don't have a, I don't have a definitive timeline at this time. Okay. Okay. That's, that's fine. I just want to make sure that we get everything done in the right way. Um, do any other commissioners have questions for staff or consultants before we dive into the document itself? Um, I, I do. Just one quick question. And Please go ahead. Commissioner Trent. Jump. Yeah, kind of uh, piggybacks on yours, Steve, regarding the uh, the EIR document. 
Um, do from from the past cycle, do we know what's in there? For example, you know, concerns with water, um, air quality, and things like that. I'm, I'm assuming that it would outline those sort of impacts. Is is that a fair assessment? Will it will it show water and air impacts? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Cool. Just making sure. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Commissioner Lottis. It, um, people pop yeah, up on I, the screens, and I, if I, if I had the whole gallery, I'd know it. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. I, um, this might be. A, I'm, a, I'm happy to ask this tonight because the, the consultants are here. But I just, I'm just curious. Um, so, in your presentation, you showed the table on. Um, the basically our commitment to the arena numbers in terms of how we would achieve that so we had and it's by income category very low low moderate page number page number is 62 52 62 62 thank you so um are we what discretion does the city have in terms of adjusting the numbers that you're presenting? I mean, I'm not, re I'm not really even sure what the basis is, but so I'm, lo I'm looking at the income categories, uh, you know, 13 units for very low, nine units for low, 10 units for moderate, and 21 units for um, above. I guess I've never heard the the cat income category above, above medium, median, I guess. Okay. Um, but if a city wants to adjust to those numbers and basically, um, let's give an example, you know, may takes, don't do as many of the above income category units and transfer some of those in that category down to very low and low. <laughs> Is there discretion to do that? And what's the rash? What is the rationale for kind of this distribution? It's um, based on um, um, SCAD's model. SCAD decides, um, well, not decides. The SCAD based it on your current income distribution, and in fact, um, and then added a a adjustment factor to it because you're a higher income community, so they want you to do. Um, um, a little bit more towards the, the lower income category. So there's already the adjustment factor. The RENA is the RENA is, is set in stone. This is the minimum requirement that you must um, uh, um, plan for, not like, from a land use perspective, not built. From a land use perspective, you must have zoning to accommodate the growth of at least 53 units and that at least 22 units of those need to be either through ADUs or through um, through sites that are um, at a higher density development in your community, like 20 units to the acre. Now, if you feel that you want to do more from a production standpoint, that you think you can do more from a production standpoint, you can certainly adjust it. But for planning, you have to meet the minimum um, of this income distribution. If you uh, if you look, there's another table in this document that shows the requirements and the accomplishments of the last cycle, and those are drawn through. Those are struck out, and new new uh, requirements are put in for this cycle. And I noted that in the two lowest categories of income, there were zero uh, in terms of accomplishments. That's arguably not a good thing, but again, the requirement is not that the city build anything. It is not that any individual parcel owner build anything. It is simply that the city provide a way, that is, if you will, get out of the way of anyone who wants to do that on that parcel. Is that about right? Correct. Okay. Does that answer your question, uh, Commissioner Nolan, uh, or no, uh, Lottis? Yeah, um, yes. So for the planning document, these are the numbers we're assigned and that's what we need to show. 
Correct. Your goals, but there's no penalty for not meeting the goal, except if you have, by omission or commission, put a hurdle in the way of accomplishing the goal. Right. And as a part of HCE's requirements, uh, just for the entire commission, we have annual reports that were mandated by, by HCD in the state to, to provide for, and they've actually created an Excel spreadsheet for us to literally plug in numbers um, in terms of how, so we, we run that report at the end of each year. So January 1st, we take those numbers, um, break them down, and then start filtering them into the Excel sheet. Have that right. come back to city council get their blessing and then send it off to HCD for their, for their records. And they actually update those records on an annual basis. Um, so just, just know that they're still watching. They're kind of a watchdog to that, to that degree as well, in terms of making sure that we're, we're sliding the scale down per se for each of these, uh, categories. Okay. And, and so there's no requirement for the city to do any development. It has the power to do development on city-owned land, except we took most of the city-owned land off the SPL list. We have one quarter acre property left. Um, but there's no requirement for anyone to actually do this development just for the city to make it possible. Correct. There, okay. there are constraints um, for the city in uh, what it can do to deny projects. Um, the, the, which, you know, so there's the, the they can't, the, the city doesn't have to do anything, but the city does, there are constraints in the law for the, if the city were to say deny a project that meets its. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. As long as the city doesn't put hurdles in the way of development of affordable housing, then whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Nolan, Vice Chair Nolan? Uh, Commissioner Trent? Vice Chair Nolan, uh, you were, you, can you please I, unmute yourself? I know I'm muted, sorry. It took me a second to unmute. <laughs> um, I was just gonna say, I didn't have any questions for the moment, but when the time comes, I do have some during the, um, when we review the um, actual document. <clears throat> Okay, well, uh, Commissioner Trent, Commissioner Swift, either of you have any additional questions before we dive into the document itself? I, I, my confidence, Lucas, is not high that we're gonna get through 100 pages tonight, but we'll give it a shot. So, right, so we could go page by page with this document if there's questions. Well, um, this, is, this is a document that unless we change it now, as long as it's sent in, as long as it's approved for submission by city council, uh, absent any changes from HCD, this document is gonna read word for word what it reads now for the next eight years. Now, I just want to preface the process that I was talking about in the very beginning um, when we were kind of going through the PowerPoint. Sure. And that is this. Planning Commission has not one but two cracks at this. So this is the first crack. It then moves to City Council as a draft for their crack and then to provide comments. It then moves to um, HCD to be... to lack of a better term, kind of the, the watchdog for regarding all the rules and regulations that have come forward over the last eight yep. years. And then those comments come back and, and Veronica's giving us the, the assurance that it sounds like it'll be probably more like 30 to, 30 to 60 days. So that's probably a fair estimate. It then comes, so those comments, we receive those from HCD and then adjust. So we could have a perfect document tonight. We feel like it's perfect, right, with revisions take it to city council. They feel like they've got a perfect document with revisions. It goes to HCD and they tear it apart, right? That could happen. That's, that's actually very likely, that's very likely that, that that'll happen. Even with us looking and with Veronica and, and her team looking at this, with staff looking at this, with planning commission looking at this, with city council looking at this. Come Christmas I, time, we'll have <laughs> comments that we have to respond to from HCD. Precisely. So I know I, I love that we're getting into the weeds on this page by page. We can do that. 
you know, you know, everybody, uh, this entire commission knows that I'm all about getting in the weeds on these things. But just understand that we're getting in the weeds tonight. It's very likely in the next two months we'll be doing the same thing again. Hope it's different weeds. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay, uh, Commissioner Trent or Swift, any other questions before we dive into the document? No. All right, we're, uh, the document starts then really well there's title pages and that kind of stuff. I would also just uh, preface it with with the this is a this is a fairly meaty document, right? And it's it a red line document, and it was provided on on Friday. I, I get that. Uh, there is the potential for us to have a meeting in July. We're meaning we get as far as we can tonight. Right. Take July off the, 7th would be the next regularly scheduled meeting. Correct. And then and then essentially providing the commission, just knowing that really the there wouldn't be really any changes made. It would be literally we stop here and then pick it back up um, on the 7th. Unless that we feel like for me, we can get as to long the, as the 7th is available to continue work if we can't finish tonight. Right. And so if the commission so felt, I think it would be a motion to uh, Continue the item. Continue the item to right. the I, I, My personal choice, and I look to the, my fellow commissioners for uh, some sort of consensus, is let's go until we get tired tonight. And if we finish within that time, great. And if we don't, then we'll continue the item to, January, to uh, July 7th and finish it then. Yes. Yeah. Um, with everybody? Sure. Yes, Commissioner Lattis. Um, I, I um, am very happy to go page by page. I, does anyone, uh, or including you, Chair, does anyone feel that they have um, uh, just some broad, broad issues they just want to bring out at the beginning? Because I do. I, ha I have one broad language issue. And, and just for a little context, I did contractual work with the Department of Defense and various private companies for 40 years. And I found that when a requirements document like an RFQ or an RFP came out, the usual wording would be the contractor shall. This is a requirement that something be done or not be done. And the commitment that came back in a proposal or a statement of work or whatever, rather than shall, it would say will. The words shall and will are intermingled here as though they were equivalent, or I'm not understanding the document. Mm -hmm. If this document is a set of requirements from on high to the city, then shall is appropriate in this document. If this document is an explanation of what the city intends to do over the next eight years with regard to housing, then will is the appropriate word to use. And the two are used almost interchangeably in many places, and we can get to it page by page if you want. But I don't know, because I worked with federal government agencies and private companies, not with state and local governments, I'm not sure if that same protocol holds here or not, but that would be one general thing yeah. that I think we ought to look at. Oh, um, maybe Pelosi? Veronica knows. Oh, oh. Yes, uh, Vice Chair Nolan, Just please. A quick comment. Um, I don't have the extent of um, experience that you do have with contracts, although I do write contracts. Um, and I actually noticed a similar thing, and, and I kept kind of going back and reading and it was kind of like the intention of you shall, and then it said, you you know, we will, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. So uh, it was a little confusing for me too. In other words, was it shall meaning like almost like the policy of, you know, this is what, what you shall do. And then was it the, like on the implementation plan that we will do it. But it, it felt like, I don't know if I'm explaining that correctly, but it just felt like a little crossover. So. Yeah. Essentially agreeing with you. Right. I'm and and I'm used to the construction of you shall and we will. But in, right. in these Two cases parties. it always says the city <laughs> shall or the city will. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and so I'm confused as to who is laying requirements on whom and who yeah. is responding to the requirement. Exactly. Well, if I can just quickly clarify that, um, because you want to track changes um, uh, document, we did, we try to not change as, uh, anything that is currently written the way it is um, without like I don't I, I, I don't want to change to anything that is shell, honestly, is all the existing housing element language. Um, I personally never use the term shell in housing element, but I was trying to respect how it, it has been written. Well, I'm okay. okay. I, I'm not sure I understood that, but I'm, I'm trying to understand, is this a document that the city is writing to say, this is what the city plans to do or has done or whatever, or is this a requirement on the city that is coming from somewhere else? I think it's the former, and therefore will, it would be the appropriate wording, I, I think. Yeah, I totally agree with you, and that's how I usually write it, but um, this is how the city's housing element is currently written your 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 current well, it doesn't adopted. mean it was written properly the last time and that's eight years ago and who knows who did it and so nobody's to blame at this point no, i just want to make sure that we may get this one right okay we will change it to will uh, if 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 i understand it properly then the use of shall is not appropriate in this document the use of will is appropriate yeah. Correct. Here's well, Veronica. Let me just, just uh, make a couple of clarifications here. I'm seeing, and and we can look at this point by point yeah. um, throughout the document, and and pay close attention to that for for the revisions as we're looking to move forward. Mm -hmm. When I'm looking at and thinking about how will is being implied and used within this document, I say I see that within the programs themselves. We will be doing this. That's like something that we have. It's a commitment to action. Exactly. It's an yes. actionable item. Shall sounds to me like something that we shall be in compliance with really the government code that is enforcing our, and really kind of forcing our hand in terms of how this housing element is being and addressed. If, if it were a communications from HCD to the city like and it shall. said you shall, I would say, amen. Yep. That's what I would expect them to say to us. But I would expect us, if this is a city document, not a requirement levied by the state government, it is. So then, then will is appropriate. Right. So Chair Kulosi, speaking strictly uh, from a oh. legal perspective, so will implies, like uh, as Lucas said, an action item yep. versus shall is Pa more of a passive uh, item. So, for example, the city shall list sites available um, as and under its SPL zone is something the city is doing passively. And so, um, one of those one of the things to perhaps consider is that in a housing in a housing element, or the city is and especially to satisfy its arena numbers, a lot of what the city does is passive. It shall have ordinances in place. It shall have as opposed to. You know, but for example, the city will approve projects versus the city shall approve projects. Well, that shall would seem to imply that city sh will, can approve projects, but is not necessarily mandated to approve projects as opposed to the city will approve projects. And there may be circumstances where the city simply can't approve a project, even if it's you know fulfilling this. And then there, there might be another project that comes along along lines that that does it. And so, it's a shall would seemingly confer more freedom of action on the city because it's more of a passive as opposed to the city will as, a, as an affirmative commitment. Okay, not my experience, but I'll take your word for it. But okay. that, um, just, but that said, I mean, shall as, a, as an action term in, a, in policy language, I, I mean, outside of the housing element, I'm less familiar with what sort of is the uh, um, convention here, but certainly with the other elements of the general plan, the use of shall in policy in your policy, um, it's it's like it's like saying yes, we're really going to do this, 
as opposed to saying, you know, we're going to encourage this or we're going to support that. It's a very, it's a very firm action word. We're going to do this and, and it's very meaningful. So, um, uh, I, I, you know, I don't think it's, I, I think, um, whether we use will or shall, it's a, those are firm words and it means that the city is going to, to actually do something. Okay, that's, that's the only global thing I can think of. Um, oops, oh, Chair Colissi. Yes, please. So I, I have, I have, uh, comments or issues or concerns but you know as I'm looking at them I was looking at my notes um, I'm realizing it's all it's all more related to the um, to the, the where the policies start and um, let's see what pages that's page goals and policies are back in the program that's chapter five I think right page 68 yeah, okay. I, I did notice in the, um, and I'm sure the, I'm sure staff has already noticed, but I noticed in contents, the page number doesn't match with what's right. actually printed. That'll be fixed. So anyway, I, I do have, I have more policy concerns. Um, and I realize that if we, so if we start at page one, I'll probably be quiet for a while. And, and maybe we can think about dividing um, the, the sessions, if we do two sessions, the first session on the, um, on the demographic information and the, the first up to page, up to page, well, everything up to page 68, then page 68 to the end is, is policy. Right. Uh, maybe yeah, my we comments can, got a lot more frequent starting with page 68. Oh, you want to start on page 68? Uh, I don't care. We so can I'm cover. Saying we could, I think we need we to go through the whole document. We can start anywhere the commission would like. Yeah, I would suggest I'll starting start. starting at the beginning, but I'll save, I will save my comments because they're issue and poli they're policy related. And, and um, so I'll save my comments on that for later. Okay. Sure, Colsey, I had, if we will start at the beginning, um, I have just a couple comments. Okay, I've got one on page 7 of 111. Are you starting before that? I'm on page 7 as well. We may have the same ones. <laughs> ah, okay. I have, I have one on page 2. Oh, good. I have one on 9. <laughs> well, you should go, we should start with 2. <laughs> All right, so, we have a bid wait, for I, page I, 1. I I have a quick question. Um, I just wanted to comment on the the shall and the the will requirement piece because I think it's important. I think we should call it out and we shouldn't just be willy nilly about changing shall and will. So just to make sure I understand what you were mentioning, uh, Chair Quilsey, is that with shall in there, you're basically it's like the a uh, 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 state mandated body is saying you shall do X, Y, and Z versus this being a document for the city saying we will do X, Y, and Z. Is that kind of what your context was? That's the context, exactly right, yes. Okay, so that, then that goes back to, you know, what are we designing this document for? Is it, are we designing it for the state or are we designing it for ourselves? Both, it's both. Both, so then we need to look at shall and will in that context. And when it comes down to the action piece, the housing action plan, Maybe that's more of the we will do X, Y, and Z. And the other pieces maybe is you shall. That makes sense. I agree with you on that part. Yeah, just I'm just trying to understand, but I yeah. think. Okay. The, yeah. okay. The, the action part and with the policy is that, okay, we're now, we, we read the part about what we shall do. Now we're saying this is what we will do to meet the commitment Correct. in the first part of the document. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, yeah. perfect. Agreed. Good. Okay. But we'll see where it goes, but I do agree with you. <laughs> well, let's let's uh, let's speed ahead to page seven. Uh, Vice Chair Nolan, oh, you had a two, comment. Page two. Oh, page two. Page two. Page two. Could they? Could you please remove the comma between my first and last name? <laughs> that's it. Go ahead. Oh, that's, that's the time. Oh, 
Could they please remove the comma between my first and last name? Oh, okay. On page two. <laughs> That's oh, good. Very good. I didn't catch that one. All right, I'll jump to page seven. So um, at the top of the page, um, it's the community context. It says the city of Ojai is a community of uh, 7.55 or 7,557 persons, da, 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 da. Then it says located on US Highway 33 in the Ojai Valley. So my question is, is that description, which is very bare minimum, there just for loose context or because it's a boundary? Um, how is that determined? And in my opinion, it may need to be re-explained um, because Highway 33 is only a portion of the city. Yeah, well, they're not U.S. highways to start. They're California highways, and it's 33 and 150. Right, but in the in this document, it just says located on U.S. Highway 33 in the Ohio Valley, and that's the description and nothing else, which to me doesn't feel accurate, but there may be a reason behind it that I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll take a look at it and revise it. And it's just, again, um, okay. We, yeah, we, we, we keep what it, what's in there. Um, but you know, if you feel that there's a, you know, certainly the better way to describe the community context, we'll, we'll fix that. I would do that for sure. And then, um, this is just a little, a typo. Um, the next sentence um, says the city is predominantly low density residential community contained within and picture that doesn't sound right either oh within four square miles and surrounded by a rural landscape of large lot large lot large estates large lot <laughs> estate. the, yeah one of the largest maybe needs to be yeah. cut yes yeah so it could be large lots, comma, large estates, or it could be large lot estates. Exactly. But, but that's, yeah, I th that's, I think, that grammar has to be fixed. Yeah. Yeah, I think the intent is to have a comma, large lot, comma, large estates. That would yeah. make more sense. Okay, yeah, it could have been that too. <laughs> <laughs> so, all of the above. All right, um, well, that's all I had on that page, but, and, and maybe the description we could have gone through to the community context, but um, I don't know. Uh, it, it, members of the commission, I just want to note, um, so the, just for context here, the underlined portion is what this round of, of uh, consultants reviewed and changed. And so if, okay. when you see it in your, uh, the red line is what, the non-underlined version is what was in the last uh, cycle uh, adopted and approved by HCD. So um, just as so, for context purposes. Okay, and I understood that, but at the same time, if we're writing a draft for the next round, don't we want to update if there was anything that needs to be uh, revised in the first, the, the previous round? Yes, yes, we will. Okay, yeah. good. All right, well, that's where I was coming from. Okay. But um, I just, um, you know, uh, for the context, it's also we were trying to respect what is already being approved by the city and assuming that you like what you have approved. And, and so we don't want to make significant changes unless it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, the consultant was making the minimum changes they felt were necessary. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I just made two, one was two minor ones, I thought. But one of them actually made, the one about the location didn't make sense to me. But um, all right, that's all I had on that page. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, anything else? Page eight, nine, ten, eleven. Um, I just had a, a quick. I just making sure I, I understand a red line that was on page nine. Um, so. Basically, it says that our population has declined by 5.1% over the past 10 years, but the population of the city increased by 1.3. Yep. Mostly younger people have left. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand. 
the last 10 years, the population of the city has increased by 1.3? Um, between um, 20, uh, 2000 and 2010, your population declined. Oh, I got you. I got you. Okay. So sorry. All right. I got you. And then it increased slightly. Okay. Over the past 10 years. Okay. I see. I was just trying to understand that. All right. Thank you. Sometimes because of the track changes, it's a little bit hard to differentiate the, the, the actual discussions. We could, uh, you know, I think I was a little, I had to read that twice also. I mean, we could say instead of over the last 10 years, we could say since 2010. Mm -hmm. That's what the last column is, you know. Yeah, that's a little more clear. Okay. Next. And then, uh, oh, I just had a, a general um question on this first part it, it goes through the demographics you know which is which is necessary um and then it provides a little bit of context saying housing needs are influenced by etc cetera, etc cetera. um is there any sort of summary at the very end that basically says you know we have a declining population our population is getting older um, our houses are a little bit older. Um, we don't have a lot of overcrowding. Uh, therefore, we're recommending X, Y, and Z. Um, we can like add that? that. We can add okay. that. That would be cool. Okay. Thank you. I have an item on page 12. If we're up to 12. Mm -hmm. Under race and, race and ethnicity, second line should say city residents are of Hispanic Latino origin. Mm -hmm. Is missing. Page 14. Anyone have anything before 14? Okay, second, pa second paragraph under household composition and size, third line from the bottom, it says nearly 38% of households are persons living alone. I think it should say city households because the immediate following sentence talks about Ojai uh, compared to other parts of the county. That's good for clarity. Yeah. Yep. Um, can I can I in, interrupt just um, just to um, make sure that my staff also is taking notes? I'm sorry. Can, can, yes, uh, I am I'm taking sorry. notes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Apologize for talking like that. And Veronica, just so you know, I'm taking notes as well. So we've got we've got a lot of note takers here right now. Okay, because um, I think because of the track changes, um, the pagination doesn't show up on my computer exactly the same way as how you are seeing it. So I'm 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 having a little bit of difficulty searching it. I'm I'm making notes uh, directly in the document as comments, yeah. Veronica. Okay. And All for right. the for the but for the I'll commission, I'll try to be as specific as I can about page, paragraph, and line. Perfect. The title. For I think the, the other title commissioners will, be good will as well. Perfect. The title will be good as well in terms of what, what the subheading is we're looking at. Okay, so that and page 14, was that clear? Where it says nearly 38% of households, I think it should say city households because it's talking about both city and county in that mm -hmm. paragraph. And I presume that's city households. Is that right? Yes. That's okay, good. anything before we go to page 17? Yeah, a quick question on back on 14. Great. Um, and this is just in general, but um, it, there's a cross out for 2010 census and it's replaced by 2014, 2018 ACS. Uh, just if you could spell out the acronyms. I, I just. Yeah. Yeah. ACS, I it occurs a lot and I didn't know what it was. That's right. American I think there's a, probably quite a few people that mm -hmm. might not get it. Yeah, right. American Census something. Sorry. The American um, Community Survey. Yeah, Are American right? Community Survey um, that replaces um, the long form of the census that we used to know. Um, so all the detailed demographics now come from the American Community Surveys. Okay. So yeah, just I'd say just spell that out versus using the acronym or spell it out once and then, you, you know, put the acronym in 
the acronym or, in quotes. Or have and then a, a one-page glossary at the back that explains all the acronyms. There you go. That'd work. That's good, too. Okay. I'm, I'm up to 17. Um, under household income, uh, that first paragraph next to the bottom line, it says earning under 80% of the median family income. Is that the county median or is that some other demographic area median income? Um, it's the county median income. Okay, could we put county in there? And then a uh, quick question, um, in that table, it's the extremely low income, very low income, low income is crossed out. Um, and it looks like it was replaced by the HUD area median family income. Yeah. So, yeah, so is that HUD area median family <laughs> right. income up there? Yeah, we need to know. The, the area median income, um, for, for your county is equivalent to the county median income and they are established by HUD. Um, for some other jurisdictions, the area median income may cover two counties. Um, so, but in your situation, it's the same thing. Okay, so here county and HUD area are used interchangeably? Uh, yes, um, we will we'll pick a, a one way to. Yeah, I think to, it'd be better if you pick one and use it, that would be good. Okay. Um, that, same, then, that same sentence in that second to the last line of that first paragraph, it says, which is comparative throughout Ventura County. I, I don't understand what that means. I think it's comparable, it meant to say. Okay, then let's let's make it comparable. Steve, where was that at, the comparable? The end of that line where it talks about 80% of the median family okay. income. Oh, yeah, I see it, yeah. Got it. Great. The... Um, Uh, just just a question on page 17 that first paragraph under un, under overpayment it estimated the 29.4 percent of owner host households and 58.6 percent renter households were overpaying for housing and that from context appears to be Ojai are there comparable numbers for the county or the HUD area uh, we can give you the county. If there if there are comparable numbers, I think it would be useful to have them inserted because the same kinds of comparisons, OHI to the entire county, are made in many other places in the document, and it would help us to know if we're better or worse, you know, characteristic by characteristic. <laughs> I am on page 20. Uh, table 2-9, labor force. There is a category called not in labor force. Um, does that include retired persons as well as people unemployed as well, no, unemployed is a separate category, fine. So what is not in labor force? That's people that have never worked, people that are not seeking jobs, people that are retired. What, what all is in there? Um, exactly like you said, um, people who are not, in, who, who are not seeking jobs, uh, children and uh, people who are retired. If okay. people who are actively seeking but could not find jobs, those, those would be the unemployed. So you started with the population 16 years and over and you subtracted all the other categories and that's what was left? Correct. Okay. So we need a, def a definition once again would be good to have there.
Um, Yeah, if you could at least add retired to that line, I think that would help because I think that's a large component of the population of Ojai. Um, page 21, the, the paragraph under projected job growth line eight, seven and eight, it says the industries with the largest projected job growth are and it starts with manufacturing. What manufacturing is going on in the city of Ojai? Yeah, that kind of outlines my or question, too. Are we too. starting the, from such a low base that if we added one person, that would be 35%? Well, it looks like the projected job growth is related to Ventura County. It doesn't talk about Ojai. So this we need to for, find that, yeah. Yeah, we need a, we need okay. a projected in job context, growth the city. then it's Ventura County. All right. But, but it's confusing because right above, it's Ojai employment sectors, and there's a nice and, chart. And I, so it, right. it, yeah, it, it and appears Dr. from Pete. context that you're right, uh, Commissioner Trent. That's a Ventura County number, but how does that relate to Ojai? Right, exactly. Unless, unless all of our workers are in Ventura Veronica, County. Someone? Which they are, but... Um, let me step in here, Veronica, just real sure. quickly. I, I, I see that, and I've, I've seen this in other housing elements, where you tend to do a comparative analysis with the county, with, with, where, with where you're residing, right? So if you're in L.A. County, you're, you're comparing apples to apples with what their percentages are, not necessarily numbers, but the percentages in terms of a comparative okay. analysis. So there's no necessary relevance to the city of Ojai in this paragraph? Well, no, because it's it's supposed to be com it's a comparative analysis, and that's really what you're seeing with this first half, these first sixty pages. Okay. That's the reason for a lot of these tables is really to do a competitive analysis with the tables, either how they sit through through census in terms of what they've come up with mm -hmm. and the numbers that they've spit out, and then um, you've got Veronica and Jamie making sense of those numbers and putting that into words, essentially. Uh, I, if these if these percentage increases apply to Ventura County generally, I I don't have any information that would say I disagree with them. But if um, they're supposed to be indicative of projected job growth in Ojai, and this is an Ojai plan, then I don't know where these numbers came from. Um, let me offer a couple of suggestions. Um, again, this is how you know it was in your housing yeah. element. I actually don't usually put it in in a jurisdiction's housing element like that. So, um, but what it does means though is uh, the whole housing element and the re the reason why you have a regional housing needs allocation, Lena, is that you are you are sharing, you're responsible for a share of the region's housing need, which that's why, to some extent, the countywide um, uh, population projection or growth projection in jobs would have some implication to Ojai because you are part of the region and you're sharing that, um, that um, household needs. Having said that, Ojai is really a, a very small town. Um, like if you are Oxnard, if you are Thousand Oaks, if you are uh, Ventura, that may have more relevancy to your city. Um, it may not have uh, that to you know, the region's um, employment growth may not have as much relevance um, um, to Ojai. So I, I would say if, it, if you feel um, strongly about that, this does not need to be in the housing element. Well, uh, yeah, yeah so I... I, I I got to if we do, if that's a consideration, which obviously it's important that we you know, are contributing to the county's needs. Um, I think in the very beginning and in the introduction under the community context, maybe something after the last sentence that says a fundamental goal of the housing element is to address the housing needs of current and future residents in ways that respect and enhance the quality of life, uh, which is the only in Ojai. So maybe something to the effect that in addition um, to help the community hit its goals, whatever. Just something that outlines how Ojai's relationship is to the community and how this plan is help helping the community address its needs as well. Yeah, I... Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does. I, I have trouble 
imagining if the manufacturing sector in the county is growing that much that we're going to have a lot of people living in Ojai and commuting to Camarillo or Oxnard for manufacturing jobs. Um, it's, that's why I, I have a difficulty understanding relevance of all those numbers. But if we could put in something like Commissioner Trent said, um, that could at least give some context to the numbers themselves. And we can certainly also add a little bit more context in this particular section to talk about how the region's job growth may have implications to local jurisdictions as to their overall housing needs in the future. That's fine. That would be great. Uh, Chair Quelsi, just a, a comment or a question about this um, section. Go ahead. Oh, so, and, and maybe it doesn't belong here, but it, it feels like it does. Um, I think it's important for us, if, if we can gather that information, to have in the projected job growth for the city of Ojai, because it's so integral to housing to the success of you know our school district to the economy to everything else it just makes sense to me that we would have some of that information um i don't think that is available um but yeah the, yeah, the employment de uh, development department does only has county-wide projections um okay, for the city. i don't know yeah, there's yeah. there's the, the table on page 22 does make it clear that all of those numbers are for Ventura County. Yeah. Okay. I just I just but, question the relevance. Well, maybe some. I mean, it could have applic applicability for Ohio, and you know, I think um, at least some of that manufacturing growth may be related to. Um, um, a clean energy. Um, I think that there is some growing uh, development, you know, with regard to solar and battery power and all that. No question. Um, so, but I just think that if you could make it clear that this is the county and that it may have, you know, and, and then whatever uh, um, applicability you think it might have for Ojai or possi possibility, um, you know, I'd like to know it because, it uh, well, it's not exactly, it's sort of housing, but, but, you know, if we're, if we have potential to really see some manufacturing growth, especially in the, um, clean energy sector, um, or, or related, uh, uh, jobs that may, that could have meaning for, um, looking at the industrial park that we have and the, the, you know, Maybe we need to save that area for for jobs and and blue uh, you know blue collar jobs. I mean jobs for for an average person. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I, I I think if you could write something about making it clear it's county and then how that might translate mm -hmm. to Ohio itself, which is a little more small yeah. and unique. Yeah. I think a, a, a nice telling statistic you could put in there is the the, um, the number of people that commute outside of Ojai to work. And I know that statistic is somewhere. I've seen it before. I just, it's not in this document. But that might be a good stat you could put in here, you know. Um, in the circulation element or something. Yeah, the circulation element. I agree element, with just, the other know. categories that are there. It's just manufacturing I have a problem with. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway. That, maybe, that might maybe help Ojai, add, add some context. Yeah, maybe Ojai could grab some of that that growth if we preserved some of our industrial sector, some of our industrial properties. Yeah. Be nice if we could. Okay. I'm up to page 24. Anybody else have anything before that? I just had a, just a quick comment on page 21. Um, on the second paragraph, this is under um, housing affordability criteria. That's the, the, the main title. Page 21? Yeah, pay, excuse me, page, wait, what page are you on? 21 20. of 111. Oh, 21. Oh, I'm sorry. I was on page 28. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I had flipped my page to hold my space there. I'm sorry. Be, the, be there in a moment. 
I apologize to my group. I'm on 24. Anybody before that? <laughs> All right, page uh, table 2-11, housing by type. There's a category there called single family attached. What is that? It's not a duplex because a duplex would be in multifamily two to four. So what is single family attached? That is a million dollar question that came from the census originally, but it, I think the way they count it is um, more like the small lot subdivisions. Um, but but still, um, frankly, it's, it's a very um, a baffling um, category for us too. But I think it actually could be um, PODs, it could be, um, I, I think it actually may be duplex. I'm I think sorry. PUDs I mean, maybe, is probably actually more more in tune because what you tend to do is you cluster those those developments together. If it's attached to another house, then it falls into multifamily two to four units. Well, not necessarily in terms what of it, how. What else would it be attached to? What about to? Creekside development and some of those townhouse um, condos? It's probably actually that's a really good point. The townhouse aspect could be townhouse it could fall condos. within that as well, where you've got you've got shared walls. Right. but you still end up owning the unit itself. Right. Well, then, it, 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 if, it's a t if the single family attached is attached to another, to another residence, it falls into one of the next two categories. But it's not multifamily. Yeah, I don't, yeah I don't think, um, I can't remember the name of the other u complex, but there is Creekside, and then the, um, yeah, there, and there's another couple. There's smaller. another. I can't think of the name. They're basically like a, con, a condominium or a townhouse, but you actually own the unit and you're sharing a wall. Right. I mean, it's we don't have a multi-family. Other places do, but. So you're saying multi-family is renters and single-family attached is owners? Um, no, this has just the unit type. It has nothing to do with tenure. Lucas, what does that mean? Veronica, please clarify that. Okay. Well, like, um, you can have single family homes that are rented. This right. table is only about the structure itself. Yeah. And you can have multifamily right. that is a co um, uh, condos uh, uh, or, or, or um, uh, townhomes are considered multifamily, and, but they are also could be rented. Um, so, so this, this, particular table deals with the physical structure. It doesn't actually talk about the, the, the who, how it's being occupied. And Ch Chair Close, if I could here. Um, yes, sing please. Single family attached is something that appears in the state documents. It appears in um, the mitigation, and it appears in many impact fee uh, laws and development fee laws. Single okay. family attached is usually defined, and our code doesn't define it, but our code has adopted the building code. And single family attached usually means one dwelling unit on a single lot with one side wall in common with a dwelling on an adjoining lot. That's usually what single family attached is referring to. Referring Zero to. lot line house. Yes, sort of. It's So one unit on a single oh. lot with sharing one common wall. OK. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there are different versions of this that we don't necessarily see in the city of Ojai, but they do exist other places in the so state. So it could be what is, is attached to is a single family on another parcel. Correct. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Um, Okay, I'm on page 27. I think uh, Vice Chair Nolan, you were on page 27. Yes? Vice Chair Nolan? Sorry, I was muted. Um, are you ready for me on 28? Oh, you're on 28. Okay, I'm on 27. Go ahead, you, you go first and then I'll follow. Uh, on, on the uh, paragraph on page 27, uh, the vacancy paragraph at the bottom, it says, in 2016, the city adopted an ordinance to address the number of short-term rental sites within the city. What they did was ban short-term rentals 
being anything less than a period of 30 days. But they already that had would, the ordinance. I think that would be right. a lot clearer than they addressed the number of short-term rental sites. They said it should be zero. Right, yeah. Um, I am not sure what changes we need to do. The city adopted an ordinance to prohibit short-term rentals of a period of less than 30 days in the city. It would be good to clarify, like, like uh, to add those clarifying words, I think. I agree. There's, there probably needs to be a little bit of stronger language than what, what's there right now. Okay. So, uh, we got some comments on this. Um, I guess, I don't know why we have a high, I, you know, the comments were, they think this is not correct. And I would, I think I agree. The vacancy rate is the highest in Ojai in comparison to other jurisdictions. I mean, that's just like right. defies, defies reality somehow. Well, I think it's, I think they're counting, I think they're counting as vacant second and third homes. Well, we're not sure. Um, most of the time, it probably would um, would be the that because if you if you prohibit short term rentals, um, the vacancy rates um, it relates to um, second home seasonally occupied and um, you know it cannot it doesn't mean that it has to be rented, but you have, you probably have a lot of people owns um, second homes here. Okay, so you're explaining it. Because because of that uh, explanation okay. would yeah. be good. As I read this, that link wasn't quite clear to me, but I, I see yeah. what you're saying. On and my block, one parcel has an ADU. I should delete the term. And another parcel has a second home. Yeah, they're 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 both vacant most of the time. Yeah, and you know, Veronica and Jamie, I I, I the one question I do have for this because this has come up several times. I've had several questions about this data specifically because it is. It's very odd that it's higher than than some of the other cities, um, and I'm wondering when when that data is extrapolated and provided, whether or not those second homes that are being identified by those specific property owners are then immediately becoming vacant simply because they're not becoming they're not their primary residence. Can you can you? Yeah. Does, that, does that sound correct? I mean, I, I feel like I'm grabbing straws here, but there's, there seems to be some, some it's, correlation. It's an to odd that. statistic for sure. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to wonder how, how the counting was done. Yeah, where's the, where's the funny math there? I think the, the, the okay, for one thing, um, this is based on the State Department of Finance population and housing estimates. It's not a survey of what actually happens in the city. So it's where did the estimate. number come from? The State Department of Finance. And they look at your building permits and they apply some kind of, um, I don't know exactly, I have to go back and read the documentation and see how they come back, come up with the vacancy rates, but it's not based on a survey. So you, you, you could we could take a look at the American Community Survey and see what that vacancy rate is uh, for your city if that is available. Um, but this is not this information is not based on surveys of your your of your residents. It's based on estimates by the state. But it does seem like the you know a, a more relevant piece of information in terms of if we're looking at places that people rent mm -hmm. would be the tremendous demand and lack of vacancy in our uh, rental units or do we talk about that somewhere else I, I mean to me that's that's really an indication of of um the the need for rental housing and and affordability mm -hmm. not not so much empty how many empty single family homes or second homes what we would do um, is 
to cross check this information against the American Community Survey, and that looks at vacancy um, maybe a little bit differently. That's based on survey. Um, the the only issue with American Community Survey is that. It's a survey about 5% of the community and you're such a small community, 5% doesn't give you a lot of accuracy either. So either way you go, um, it, it's only an estimate, but we'll cross check that information from the ACS. Is there, is there, uh, is there, is it appropriate for a reference to be made to the um, limited availability of rental units uh, as advertised and that appear to be on the market? Could some some notation meet, be made about that and added to this? That's in there uh, later in the document. Oh, it is later? Yeah. We did do um, a survey of the, um, well, we, we do, we, we did review um, rental listings in yeah. your community and did say that there are limited rentals. Uh, but again, what we can see is what's being posted, you know, advertised. Um, oh, a lot of people don't actually advertise. I, yeah, I, I see on page 31 you've got that. I, I, think, I think perhaps we're just frustrated with the lack of context here. Um, okay it would be good to know what the basis for those numbers was. I mean, we have something, something just in excess, I think, of 3,000 residences in the city, something like that. If the vacancy rate is 8.7%, that says there's around 250 vacant dwelling units in the city. If that were the case, do we really have a problem? If there's, if there's that much excess capacity just in what's currently built, not even counting the hidden ADUs, do we have a problem? Let me just try to, and I think Veronica is hitting on something here. I, I, have, I have a feeling that Veronica and, and Jamie are gonna go back and look at these numbers a little closer. But j just know that it, hypothetically let's say for instance the the number is 200 right that's the number it's the eight percent that's being spit out right now that doesn't necessarily mean that they're being rented it just means that those are vacant houses apartments any ADUs. at any given time there's at 200 any, any vacant given, 250 vacant dwelling units in the city and that happens to be taken i mean remember it's the department of finance so they're spitting out these numbers and that's coming out i think on an annual basis veronica correct yeah, me i just yes. and yeah. and it may be also the department of finance uh, tends to use a metric of where people define as their primary residence so if somebody owns say a second home in ojai um but they own another home their primary residence is in the city of la there's one like that on my block then, I, I just don't understand if that's what they're counting then the city could, the we'll go back and see if there is another way to look at vacancy rates and then certainly we'll look at how um, the Department of Finance come up with vacancy or, rates. Or, or just an explanation of what counts in the vacancy rate. Is it, is it really dwelling units that are available for sale or rent that are not currently occupied or does it count other things than that? It, if, if if we go with the census defin definition of vacancy rates, it includes vacant for sale, vacant for rent, um, vac um, vacant rented but not occupied um, or sold but not occupied, boarded um, and abandoned. Um, that's all the, that's under the census um, definition of vacancy. None of those things sounded like second homes to me. Well, and seasonally occupied. That's, oh, seasonally that's occupied. Home. Yeah, that's second home. Okay, then for my purposes, it becomes a meaningless statistic. Okay, fine. Um, I'm on to page 28. Uh, okay, Vice Mayor Olin, you had something? Go, sorry, can we go? Oh, yeah. go ahead. I'm go sorry, ahead. go ahead, John. Okay, I just, sorry, going back to that vacancy rate, uh, Number three. So the purpose of that, right, is to help us understand what the need for housing is, 
And if we have a very low vacancy rate, then obviously it would say that we need more units, right? Correct. If we have a high vacancy rate, that would say maybe we don't need that many units. So I think what Chair Quilsey was getting at is if we understand, I mean, if this is supposed to help us make a decision, then we need to have some metrics that kind of make sense um, or a better understanding of these metrics. Mm -hmm. um, because just according to this table, first glance, it's like, well, we don't have a problem. We got plenty of, you know, we got high, you know, there's, look at all that opportunity for people to rent homes. And that's not necessarily the case. How, so, how aggressive does the city need to be in right. terms of encouraging building new housing? Right. The vacancy rate plays right into that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if the, what we're using to determine that vacancy rate is not accurate, then it makes it really difficult to make a decision because you're exactly. making a decision on false information. Yeah. Right. We don't know if they're available or not. They may be vacant, but they may not be available. Yeah, they might be second homes or- May not, yeah. in which case, I guess we just ignore the statistics because they're not relevant. Or at least they are not, they are not actionable information for us. And I, I Look, sometimes in, in this data, it does end up being skewed based on the community and the, the context of, of what goes on in this community, right? So it is, we are a destination. I mean, I, don't, I, I may get chastised by saying this, but we're tourists in a destination at a certain point, right? That's just, that's ingrained into this community. It's been that way for, for quite some time, whether or not we want to, to admit it. You're seeing some of that data skewing or some of that funny math coming out of that. I think that's that's what's happening here. Uh, I don't want to necessarily dwell on, dwell on this too much. I know Veronica and, and Jamie will look at these numbers a little closer. So, okay. Chair Quillis, you have a comment on page twenty-eight. Please go ahead. Or just maybe I, I need a little clarification. So on the second paragraph, um, right in the middle of the paragraph. It's, um, and this is re regarding housing affordability criteria. They use the criteria for a five person household. And was that selected because that's considered a large household? Is that why they chose the five, number five? Yes. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure I understood that correctly. All right, that was my only, only thing on that page. Okay. Somewhere, somewhere on this page, there was the The uh, the number four hundred seventy seven thousand was that a an affordable sale price? That's only how much they could afford. It's an estimate, you know. Again, it's just an estimate, but that's that's the maximum they could afford. And you obviously don't have a lot of homes in your community at that price. I I, I would challenge you to find a single home for sale in Ojai for four hundred seventy seven thousand. But that's I don't think exactly it exists. The, that, that's exactly the problem is that's how much a low income, a moderate income household can afford. That's why the, the, the conclusion is that they cannot afford to buy a home in your community. Right. Okay. Or as, as uh, I mentioned some time ago, and it, as it was told to me by a rather insightful person, people that live in Ojai can't afford to work in Ojai people that work in Ojai can't afford to live in Ojai. So we get a lot of traffic in addition to everything else that goes on. Sure, Quillacy. Go I, ahead, please. I, I have a question on the, um, uh, that I wouldn't mind if I could ask the consultant because it is regarding rental units versus um, for sale units in terms of uh, meeting the demand for affordability. And I just, uh, I you refer to a page and a paragraph. Oh, no, it's just because we were talking about a rental versus um, uh, trying to trying to assess the, the rental and then the, the form for sale units. Okay. And just what is in terms of the housing expertise that's out there, including you, um, what is the current thinking about rental units? about the viability and um, the better choice in terms of meeting of the demand for affordability when you're looking at rental housing versus for sale housing. Do you, is there, 
Is there any, what is the thinking about that in, in terms of better serving the there, demand? Yeah, there's certainly a financial reality to it um, that if you uh, trying to help the very low and low income households, um, most likely you're going to go into the rental housing market because the subsidies required to build a for sale housing for a lower income household is is almost prohibitive and 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 also some of um, you know the 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 idea is that you you help a household that's very low income household you spend about probably about five six hundred thousand dollars to help one household to own a home but the same six hundred thousand dollars you could have helped four households probably and or at least three um, with rental and so and 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 given the the dire needs and uh you know of of these low-income households um maybe you know and the limited funding available maybe more cost efficient to focus on rental housing for lower income but when it comes to be like moderate income you may want to also you can you can probably focus on the for sale housing market and one thing that is very um um uh, true is um hut was promoting home ownership um uh, really strongly probably before the you know great depression um there were a lot of hut homes that were helping home like low-income households to buy the homes and that um HUD can only help people up to 80% of the county median income. That's all they can help, those who consider low income. When the recession hit, the first that actually went foreclosed are all the homes that were HUD, HUD assisted. So I think uh, no households in that income level have more difficulty maintaining a mortgage and the property taxes and the utilities and the maintenance associated with that. So not to say that you shouldn't try, but it really, you know, depending on your um, you, on the financial capacity that you have as a local jurisdictions. But if you talk to a nonprofit developers, um, um, they'll probably um, agree. In fact, we just talked to the um, the housing authority of the city of Ventura uh, recently, and that's the, the direction that they're going with the lower income focus on the rental housing. People with moderate income for sale housing could be okay. enough. Okay. Oh, th I, um, I had never. Uh, thank you. I, I, it's uh, added to my understanding. Thanks. Okay. Uh, moving on. Uh, how about uh, I'm on page 31. Anybody have something before that? Um, I just wanted to, add, to kind of chime on to that prior conversation. Um, and you mentioned that it's prohibitive to build, uh, you know, homes or, or traditional housing. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to find that somewhere in the document. Do you have something like what the estimated cost per square foot is to build a traditional home? And, you know, like a 2000 square foot house that's, you know, through bedroom to bath, like how much does that cost to build? Um, because obviously, you know, that's going to go into how much you can rent it for and how much you could sell it for, for affordable. Um, so just curious if you've, if that's in here somewhere. Um, no, because it's really very, very different, uh, like depending on the quality of the construction and materials that you use and the fees and, and, and all that. So it's very difficult for us to just estimate, um, you know, how much it would cost to build. And, and then on top of that, you, you are, the land is the most important component um, 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 to buy a single family lot or to buy a piece of land that's low density, vacant um, to build housing, um, it's, it's, it's expensive. Um, so that's the, usually the subsidies involved for ownership housing is just because the density is, is you know, at single family neighborhoods at the maximum is probably about eight units a day per or so. When you talk about a multifamily 20 unit by, by virtue of like economies of scale, um, you're just not going to get there. Um, but in terms of exactly how much, um, I think it's too difficult for us to estimate because there are so many variants that would 
you know, change the, the equation. Oh, I got you. I guess, um, you know, just having a, a general understanding of what that is, the, this, this cost per square foot on just a, you know, to build a home would be helpful. Well, you can look at construction costs. There, is, there are ways to look at the, just average construction costs, but that's not yeah, going to go. help you that much, though, because, um, you know, a multifamily. Well, we'll take a look at it. Maybe it, it you know, if that's an, an, an interesting piece of information that you want to take a look at, we can look at construction costs. Um, yeah, because it, it just brings up that idea that, you know, kind of what Ventura was outlining that they're looking at the rental piece just because, you know, typically because costs are so high, you have to build on top, you know, you have to build multi story units um, in order to you know, to have a contractor or developer break even, um, you know, or. Yeah, uh, so, John, I've heard numbers in the three to $400 a square foot range, but I think that includes the land. Okay, okay, yeah. I, I, so it'd be interesting to know what that is with that, because obviously we have height restrictions in Ohio, which makes it limit, limited as far as how high we can build stuff. Yeah, I, I can chime in on that. I know on average it's three to $400 a square foot without the land. Right. And now with COVID, it's between four and five hundred. Yeah, oh. everything's skyrocketed. Um, yeah. yeah, my understanding is the cost of lumber has skyrocketed in in yeah. recent. Yeah, it's it's down. The cost of lumber is down lately in the last month or so, but it's still t three times what it was a year ago. So for like a a, a small house, a twelve hundred square foot house, it would be like. Four hundred eighty thousand dollars just to build the house. Yeah, without the land. Yep. Yeah, so that that's that's cost prohibitive right there for low income folks. Can't be done. Nope. Okay. Um, I'm on page thirty one. Anybody have something before that? I have two questions. Um, as we go through this. We are constantly shifting back and forth from Ventura County statistics to Ojai statistics to zip code 93023 statistics. And in the, on page 31, the paragraph on rental housing, it says a survey of rental apartments listed on Zillow. Was that county? Was that 93023? Or was that city of Ojai? Yeah. Um, I think when we did the survey, it would be um, um, it was just the city. Yeah, it would be city. I'm sorry. The the apartment uh, market rental survey was conducted for the entire county, but the data reporting is within the study. The data for it's is for your city. So the, they've done a study countywide for per jurisdiction. So the number for you is is for city. So the survey of rental apartments listed on Zillow was for Ventura County as a whole. The Zillow. Uh, 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 estimates are from Ojai, just the city of Ojai. Just the city of Ojai, not 93023. Correct. Okay, could we at least say in Ojai then? Because we have, yes, well, we have throughout this document at least those three different sets of statistics, the city, the zip code, and the county. And I think as we go through and start quoting numbers, we need to be careful to specify which set of statistics we're talking about. Um, table 2-16, median housing sales prices, Ventura County. Uh, there was only one that didn't make sense to me, and that was Port Wyneme, where from 2019 to 2020, it actually went down. Oh, and SOMAS went down. This is all statistics from Core Logic. Okay. Seemed really odd. Um, yeah, but because the number of sales is so um, is limited, sometimes 
that particularly for somas. It's certainly a small sample size in somas. Right. right. So so one one cell that may be like a mobile home or, or whatever, I don't know, uh, would just um, be an outlier and, and pull the, the numbers down. But, you know, core logic is the biggest um, um, kind of real estate data company. Um, okay. Yeah, so okay. we, we can only rely on what they provide. Um, I'm on to page 32. Anybody have anything? Steve, I have one, just one comment back on 31 real quick. Sure. If that's okay. Because um, you made a point where you mentioned, you know, the data that we're looking at is either like the County of Ventura or it's 93023 or it says Ojai. But I'm wondering if it where it says Ojai, it should say City of Ojai because every residence in 93023 is an Ojai mailing address. Is that well, good? I guess they well, yeah, I guess they do. Everybody that lives between Oakview and Summit, up at the top of Upper Ojai, it's Ojai. can yeah. call themselves Ojai. That's what the mailing says. So yeah. I was just wondering, should it? That's the I don't know if that's code. redundant because we know this is the City of Ojai housing element, or if there's some clause somewhere at the beginning that it says Ojai refers to you know the city limits of Ojai or the City of Ojai. But just maybe for clarification, because it does get a little confusing in a couple of places. That's why I asked the question on yeah, page 31. Exactly. It, yeah. if, if Jamie says that's for the city of Ojai, I'll take her at her word. I don't know where else it's been broken out that way. Yeah. Um, anyway, whatever it is, it should be consistent through the document so that it's clear. But anyway, that was my comment, and we can go to the next page. <clears throat> yeah, okay. And here on page 32 now, table 2-17, we have another term inserted called Ojai Valley. What is that? Is that 93023 plus Oakview plus Casita Springs? 93022, yeah. Or what is it? Mm-hmm. What 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 does Ojai Valley mean? Needs to be defined, yeah. Um you know, I we can take a look at whether the study says it, but um this is the rent survey that we're using. Um if they did not define Ojai Valley specifically, we don't have a way of knowing what they what's how how that was determined okay well i hate to leave meaningless statistics in the middle of this housing element but right now ohi valley to me could be 93023 plus 93022 plus part of 93001 which is casita springs yeah. but only part of 93001 so what does the number mean? Um, we'll see what the, the report, if the report um, defines it. Thank you. Um, page 33, anybody else on 32? I have 33. Table 18, 2-18, disability tallied by type, okay. I understand all the various kinds of disabilities. Got plenty of them in my own family. Uh, but does this count, for example, residents of the Gables and various assisted living facilities like the Manor? And if it does, fine. If it doesn't, fine. But we should say, where did these numbers come from? ACS, okay. Uh, yeah, American Community yes, Survey. To every and resident. Everybody in supposedly uh, everybody in the city, whether they live in housing units or residential care facilities or um, nursing homes. Okay, so the answer is yes. All right, fine. Uh, okay, page thirty-four. Uh, the table 2-9, uh, we've, we've got the 
at least here it says within zip code 93023, second paragraph about halfway down. That's good. That's much bigger than the city of Ojai, but at least it's clear what the statistic is. Um, on the table 2-19, it is not clear to me. The first, the first row says senior headed households. The second says households with seniors. That means headed by someone else but there's a, at least one senior living there? Correct. The definitions are, are, are not clear to me. And okay. then seniors living alone, and then senior population is the total. Total number of households. Um, total number of seniors. I'm sorry? Um, senior population is total number of senior persons. Household is an occupied housing unit. So you can have a, a household that is headed by a senior. That's the first uh, role. Um, but households headed by seniors would, um, um, that's separate from households that have seniors. So that would be um, uh, inclusive people who are headed by, um, inclusive the of 39.30% is part of the 42.5%? Um, 39.3% is, is part of the 42.5%. Okay. And then seniors living alone um, would be the 19.5% is part of the, is part of the 39.3% um, is also part of the 42.5%. Okay. And I, I just I can't uh, make the numbers add up. I'm sorry. I, I don't know what the problem is. There, there are not mutually exclusive cat, uh, categories. Okay, I give up. Uh, Veronica, with this with this table, it is kind of interesting. I mean, the person 65 and older. Um, I well, mean, that 65 and older and 65 and under, that's, that's struck out. That's not part of the category anymore. I'm looking at, well, I'm looking at the, the heading of the table. It says persons 65 and, and, and over. Right, the top. So I guess my question is, is what's the, what, what base number is this taking it off of where we're getting 42% of what? I think that's... I think really kind of that's what the question that I would have, and I think that's really what the chair is getting at as well. And I'm I'm assuming the, the commission's kind of seeing the same thing as well. Okay. So I would so, say tease that information out a little bit more. Okay. It's based on your total households in the city. So all, about amount all of the households in your city, almost forty percent of them are senior headed households. That that head of households is a senior person. About 42.5% um, of the households, total households in the city has a senior person in it. Um, that actually is not as important a piece of information than compared to the senior headed households. Then the, um, within the senior headed households, 598 percent, 598 of them or or just seniors living alone. Mm -hmm. and, okay, and, well, and the, see the first and second rows are counting households. Right. The third row, since it's seniors living alone, counting people and counting households is the same thing. Correct. The last row is counting people. Right, and that's why the table says it's total households or population. And so you can't population. add any of those numbers to get the bottom row. You're not supposed to add them because they're not mutually exclusive categories. So senior, if you want to start from the beginning, like senior, senior household, households with senior may, if we reorder it, households with seniors would go on top. Within the households of seniors, you have senior head households. 
within the senior head of households, you will have seniors living alone. So overall, they're not, they're, you're not adding them because they're not mutually exclusive categories. Yes, it's just, okay, it's mixed, it's it's mixed numbers in a single table. I got it. I, I'm not sure what use it is, but there it is. All right. Um, I'll reorganize it a little bit, and so hopefully it'll be more clear. I think what might help with, with that one too, Veronica, is, is having, I mean, it's, it's saying it's the, it's told at the very end, it says percent of, for the, for the table 2-19, percent of total households or population. But I think what's important here is what, what is that, is it the base population that we looked at on page seven, I want to say, at the mm -hmm. very beginning? Is that, is that what we're looking at here in terms of what we're looking at for 2020? Um, no, I think that's really what, what I'm... American Community Survey. So you have to um, compare um, apples with apples as well. So when we do the percentage, it will be based back on what is the total population as reported by the American Community Survey uh, for, for the 2014 to 2018 um, 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 uh, data set. So what we will, what I would say, um, um, Jamie, what we'll do is take out the senior population role in this table because it confuses um, um, like population and households together. And then we would organ reorganize, start with households with seniors. And then within the subset of households with seniors, you have you have senior headed households. And within the senior headed households, then you have um, seniors living alone. Mm -hmm. When it's a senior headed household, you may have more than one senior in the household, like my household. Correct. But we wouldn't know the answer to, to we, we don't have the but statistics. But we count in both the first two categories. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the way the table was originally, it talked about persons 65 years and older. Actually, the first category was under 65. Um, that at least spoke to something that I think people could understand. Here we're talking sometimes about households, sometimes we're talking about persons. Mm -hmm. And it's in the same table, and it's not clear what the percentages are related to. We, we, that's why I'm uh, suggesting that we'll remove that uh, senior population role from the table. We can just talk about it in the text that about, you know, um, X percent of the population is seniors. Um, and, and then we go from there. From, from a housing perspective, um, the senior population itself is not as important as senior head of households and senior living alone, because um, that's where it has some implications as preferences, um, affordability, and, and assistance needs. And special needs. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Now, now, question there. I don't know if this, if you could do this, but to help with context, would it, would it, could you put in the county numbers in there too? Because you do have them on page. 10, when you talk about age of population and you've got, you know, Ojai, we have 25% uh, of the population is 65 and over versus the county, which is 14.6%. But could you put also county numbers in here too, to give us a little bit of um, context and clarity around uh, the senior headed households, et cetera? I think so. Okay, yeah, that that'd be helpful. Uh, you understand, Lucas, what I'm, what I'm trying to accomplish here is to look at this and say, if I'm part of the legislative body now, that's who we're recommending this to. If I see this table, do I conclude that Ojai has a problem, that Ojai has no problem, that Ojai has special problems? What am I, as the legislator, supposed to do with this information? I can't figure it out right now. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I think that's true with some of the data that we're looking at here and what the, what the point of, of some of this data is, and Veronica, you can, you can jump in here as well, is it, it's, it's, it's not necessarily looking at a single point of data, but it's looking at the holistic sure. um, aspect of, of all of the, the tables that we're looking at here and then drawing conclusions from that. And I think that's what you're seeing with some of the programs um, that we're, when we'll get to those programs that we that the consultant is uh, working with staff have, have put together as 
as part of the sixth cycle of the housing that we're looking at here. Can okay. I can well, I just ask a, a, a quick question here for the in, entire commission? Um, we're, we're diving into the details of the numbers and I'm loving it. But one, one question is here, I, I keep seeing this happen over and over again. It's kind of uh, becoming a bit of a, of a trend. And that is, we look in the, at the data and, and Veronica immediately is saying, we can look at that further. I'm hearing that over and over again. I almost feel like that if there are global comments regarding each and every one of these pages, I get that. If the commission is agreeable with the data component of this, which I think stops for the most part when we get up to the programs that we're looking at, that we'll yeah. be looking at as well, I almost feel like uh, Veronica and Jamie are going to go back and look at this data and, and the comments that the commission um, has put together at this point. I'm assuming, but I, I mean, I would ask for the commission for clarification that each, each commissioner is at some point has put comments on specific pages. Um, and if you have done that, maybe it would be easier for the, for the consultant to take those comments, make those revisions for us to fast forward to, to the program stage. Because the, the option still exists that we could meet again on the 7th um, and, and with those revisions. Yeah. Or have those revisions as a part of the the I'm happy to hand my 85 way. pages to you or the consultant um, and on, on that point you know I, I would note that you know we have a w commission is not necessarily it's there it's not a hard deadline but it is a deadline to get this to the um, uh, the City Council which will have its own review um, the City Council does not have a meeting in July I believe so their their first meeting is in August their turnaround time and their additional comments will likely happen August and then it's got to go back to the consultant for final review before being submitted to HCD at the end of September. And so um, perhaps it makes sense for especially like Lucas said comments on specific metrics like where did this data come from it's the consultant may not have this information right now at hand but if they're if they are going back it may make sense to submit all of those queries at once before uh, our next meeting so that the commission will then come, uh, the consultants will then come back with answers as to where particular data da uh, data came from. And maybe that would be an introduction to the next meeting to say that this data came from this where, this data came from. And the data, the, the data where the data came from is called out, but you know, um, the focus of the planning commissions, what, what HCD expects is less so the data, but what the city is doing to meet its housing, regional housing needs allocation. So um, that is how the city is, is the policy aspect of it. And so that's where commission really has the, the major role in shaping the policy aspect of it. Um, and how staff and how the city will plan to address the, uh, the units that, uh, the construction and facilitation of the units the city needs to meet its agenda or it ne needs to meet its regional housing uh, needs. Nikhil, just to comment on that, um, the data should drive the policy, right? That, Otherwise, correct. we're just uh, that's making correct. stuff up. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. And, um, and, and I'm, I think, though, given that we're seeming we're, we're, there's a gap between what the commission wants and what the consultant can do today. I think perhaps it makes sense to uh, submit those in writing to the commission uh, consultants directly, and uh, so that they have a better chance, right? um, so that they know that which table they should be looking at. And uh, yeah, no, I, it's all fair. It, yeah, it's all yeah. No, I, I gotcha. So where do the programs start? It was around page eighty-five, wasn't it? Page 68. 68, okay. But I have a policy comment before then. Great, go ahead. Um, page 57. I don't 
you know, talking about infrastructure com uh, constraints, and th that's why I asked the one question about um, the regulations for the uh, arena numbers. Um, but I don't think we've done justice in this this uh, section to the severity of what we're dealing with in terms of um, the, 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 the diminishing water resource that we have and oh, how unique Ojai is. I mean, we get all of our water from the mountains that drainage, drain down into the, the Ojai Valley. And that's all we have. And um, so in, in view, in the light of climate change, you know, the projected, the pro, um, projected future warming and probably likely <laughs> years of drought, uh, you know, we need to talk about this more seriously because it is, it is a huge constraint. And I think it's something that potentially deals with um, how much housing, how much new housing we can, we can provide. Um, and I, somewhere else there was something I didn't quite understand about um, the water purveyors have a responsibility to um, give priority to affordable housing units in terms of providing water, but that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that they take away water from existing users. Is that right? No, they'll just keep selling it till they run out. <laughs> and. and um, you know, if we're heading to a stage five uh, limit on uh, stage five uh, water use limitations, uh, perhaps this summer, I, you know, I, I just so I just think I think we really need to look at this section and really get serious about how what a constraint this is because it's big and it's not a, it's not a moderate drought. I don't see that on 67. Kathy. 57. 57. Then more on the next page. We have we have less than 25, 24%. We got four inches of rain, I think. Maybe yeah, five. five. Just under five. And our normal rainfall is 20 inches or more. So, I mean, we're not talking about this, and we need to talk about it, and the state needs to know that we are in a unique situation. We have a unique um, uh, access to water for the entire valley, and we are severely constrained. And this is, this is actually, I, I'll, I'm just going to do a sidebar here for a second. This is a real problem because when you, when you we were, the, the council doesn't want to have a climate, a climate um, element. And the problem is we have these issues colliding. We have a need for affordable housing. We have uh, an extreme water shortage. We have increasing heat. Uh, and so, so we're supposed to weave in climate change issues and policies throughout every document. But this document is not weaving it in because we're only focused on affordable housing. We're not talking about any issues related to housing and related to climate. And we must. So it's a it's a it's a big gap that I'm seeing here that's rearing its head right here on page 57. So I think we've got some work to do with this. I think we do too. Yeah, uh, and not not to unfairly pile on, but yeah. in, if well, we're going to okay. talk, if we're going to talk about water, Ojai has the oldest water infrastructure in the valley. It was the first water structure infrastructure put in. The age of it was the major problem with flooding the theater downtown. In addition. The water pressure and water flow that is available that will be certified by Casitas, which is our supplier, and by the way, we do get lake water up here, not just basin water, but the water pressure and flow is too low 
to provide adequate fire suppression. And fire is the other big problem we have, fire and water. So new construction must have sprinklers to try to suppress fire before it exits an individual structure and endangers the neighborhood. None of that is in here. And I think it's, it's even more critical that we say something about that as context for the water infrastructure. And the city ban, as far as I know, on water wells is still in effect. Is that right? Okay. So nobody can, nobody can punch new holes in the basin, but Casitas will continue to sell us water out of the lake. And they will give a will serve letter to anyone who wants one, because all that means is, yes, I can hook up a pipe to that parcel. It doesn't mean that there's going to be enough water either for domestic use on that parcel or for fire suppression if that's necessary. Veronica? Um, I think that's, you know, um, you know, Lucas, and we're going to have to work with you and see, you know, if there are any water studies that we can go back and incorporate into the housing element, because right now, um, we, we don't have a, a lot of data that we, you know, that you're looking for, but I'm sure that we can work with staff to incorporate additional uh, information. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, page 58 talks about wastewater. I happen to cl claim a little bit of knowledge here since I'm on the sewer board, but it does not mention individual parcel septic systems in wastewater. And most, if not all, of the arbolata is not connected to the sewer system. I think we need some mention of that. Okay. And a question, a question for Nikhil, page 60. Uh, and and uh, this, this was in Mr. Miley's letter, but he did not mention it this evening. It says, this is in the fair housing paragraph, to the extent legally permissible, giving preferences to persons and households currently residing or employed in Ojai with regard to new affordable housing. I think you have said, or other city attorneys have said, that is not a legal basis for determining whether or not someone is eligible for affordable housing. Is that's that correct? Well, that's why it says to the extent legally permissible. Uh, but is that is that just words to cover the word zero? Um, so is it is it legally permissible at all to discriminate on the basis of where you live or where you work in determining whether you can get into affordable housing? So that is actually the concept of uh, location-based uh, discrimination is disfavored. However, specific laws like FIHA allow in certain circumstances for, um, for example, you, if you are somebody who is in a situation where you can't relocate somewhere else, you naturally will get a preference to your local area. The, the point of uh, the, Fair Housing and uh, the, Fair Housing, the Fair Employment and Housing Act is to protect people who are in situations, one of, one of, the, one of the policy goals behind it. And so uh, a, pr a local preference with respect to FIHA is fine. With respect to? F Cal the California Fair, Fair Employment and Housing Act, the very beginning here. So if, if somebody lives in Ojai in, in some sort of dwelling right now, and they want to get into affordable housing in Ojai, which presumably would be less expensive. Correct. They get a preference because they say, I can't afford to live somewhere else? They can get a preference. I mean, it depends on the context of the program. These uh, FIHA programs are very specific, and the law is very specific, but there's no blanket, uh, there's no blanket uh, local preference. However, de depending on the circumstances. So that's why we say to the le extent legally permissible. So someone, for example, may um, qualify f under an, a different element of FIHA. So they may be a local resident, but they also might um, be 
low income disadvantaged or part of a socioeconomic group, and that coupled with that would allow them to get a local preference. And, and they get a preference over someone who lives, who is otherwise similarly situated, but living in Casita Springs. Correct. Okay. Um, but again, like I said, it's very case specific. There's no blanket. And so any, any po program or policy, so um, any program or policy that, that we say implement subject to FIHA is going to be very case specific. Okay. Um, here on this page, the bottom of page 60 and in a number of other places, there's a reference to uh, an analysis in Appendix D. There's nothing in Appendix D. It is empty. Um, yes, um, that was the, the that will be forthcoming because the guidance um, that were released by the state to do this analysis came really too late for us, and we really needed the site inventory to do the analysis. And given the time that we um, between. June 2nd, where um, the site inventory was decided, uh, we just didn't have enough time to do the analysis. When, when do you expect that you would have it? Or is this to be something that the Planning Commission will say, well, whatever it says is fine, we'll recommend it sight unseen to the City Council? Being that this is, I mean, Veronica, chime in here but I wanted to just make a, a quick point here being that this is the first this is literally the first time uh, agreed that any cities agreed so just know that <laughs> the whole thing's redlined I mean, it's it's a brand new analysis that's required I understand by the state. Yeah. I, I, that's why I I was perhaps overly agitated at the outset of the meeting at the thought that the expectation was we would pass this on to the city council at the end of the evening tonight. So I guess my question for Veronica, where are you at in, in producing that, that document? I know we had talked and, and it was the realistic possibility of it coming before this planning commission for this meeting was, it just wasn't realistic. Well, yeah, it's about, you know, easily 30, 40 pages of maps and data that we have to go through. Um, and in fact, um, I am, I am meeting with the state um, because I am a little concerned about this analysis being onerous. Um, so I, I approach the state and they are agreeing to meet with me um, next week with their fair housing team to kind of go over what exactly is needed, um, especially for small communities like yours because the the meaningful actions that they and 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 just to give you a context and I, I don't think I have you know I might have mentioned that or already that we did the the analysis for uh, Imperial Beach in um, in San Diego County because they were the first um, you know Imperial San Diego County's housing element is ahead of you um, we did that analysis in the dark because there was no guidance at all. And we kept trying and trying and trying. And it took us four times to go back to the state until they, they approved it. Um, and I was told last week um, they really liked it. Um, and they're actually using it as a sample for other jurisdictions in the state. As, and uh, my understanding is it's the only one that's approved by the state right now. But it's about 60 pages of analysis and three pages of meaningful commitments. And, and that seems just really onerous for a jurisdiction of your size. And so that's the reason why I wanted to meet with the state is how do we, what exactly are they looking for? What exactly are they, you know, what would we consider reasonable? And, and so I'm hoping that with a response from them next week that I will be able to do an analysis that's more appropriate for your community and the, the actions included in there would be more um, in line with the, the resources that you may have. Um, having said that, I think um, we were certainly intended to get it done before the city council meeting um, um, in August. And so between now and, and, and July, um, 
will we'll have it done, but how the process of getting it reviewed by you, I think, Lucas, we need to figure it out. Well, it would a draft Appendix D in the same condition as this first draft be available in three weeks? In three weeks. That's our next scheduled meeting, three weeks and five weeks. Right. Um, Jamie, what do you think? I'm sorry? I think we can do three weeks. Um, we'll have to coordinate with Lucas on actions, and then we really only have to do the sites analysis now that we've nailed down our uh, sites. So uh, a bulk of the analysis is done. I think three weeks is doable. Okay. But I also want to make this commission aware that it is, Veronica, you said 40 pages. So just know that with the revisions that we're looking at here and the 40 pages on top of that, mm -hmm. I will get that to you as soon as possible. But well, as you said, October 15th is going to be here a lot sooner than we might it think. It is. And that's, that's the challenge that we have yeah. here. We have a very tight schedule here. But... Um, but I think we have a responsibility to look at this before we say to the city council, we think you ought to adopt this. That's what, that's what concerns me. If it's not here, I can't take a position on, on whether the city council should submit it. Right. So the recommend, so recommendation to city council is that the the, it'd be forwarded to city council. We're not doing adoption yet. Um, no, no, not, I understand. Adoption comes 100, within 120 days after October 15th. Um, but there, the outcome of the planning commission review of this document should be, we do or do not recommend that the city council submit this as amended, if it's amended, to HCD. So how do we do that if there are parts of it that aren't here? Yeah, I, that's, and that's the reason why we're putting a rush on this. Well, shall we go to 68? I mean, I've written down other comments as well. I hope that they make sense. If they don't, I would advise the uh, Lucas or the consultants to just call me. But I need to have a copy of it so that I can refer to it. So maybe, maybe what you could do is, uh, and maybe I don't know about the other commissioners. Have you written notes on all these pages? And if you get questioned about your notes. Do you need a copy of the notes? Um, yeah, I probably would need a copy. Maybe I'll just take this home and make a copy and then, and then uh, give you back the original tomorrow or something. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was talking about earlier is if there's notes that each of the commissioners have made up to this point, scan them, um, take photos of them. There's a, there's a PDF format that you can use even with your phone that allows it to convert immediately, so. I've been in the consulting business. I know what a mad scramble it is all the time, and I'm not criticizing anybody for the state of this document in any way. I'm just saying I think the commission has a responsibility, and I don't know how to complete that responsibility without going through what we're going through. Yeah, and, and just to, I mean, there's there's, each, each of these cycles is not less information that we're providing to the state. It just continues to be more. So just, it's always more. Just know that the four cycle is not the same as the six cycle. Yeah. The same, or the same as the fifth cycle. So. And the seventh will be worse. Yep. Right. Well, why don't we try to get through what we can of the programmatic stuff. Let's start on page 68. I've, I've got a question on page 68. The, the goal one, it talks about linking jobs with housing. What does that mean? The very end of goal one under adequate housing sites. 
What does linking jobs with housing mean? Are we saying we're, we're supposed to build houses where the jobs are? Are we saying we're supposed to recruit people to work where the houses are? I, I, I don't understand what it means. I and think I'm, it can be met, um, interpreted in, in, in multiple ways. Um, and, and again, this is um, how your housing element is currently written. So we try not to um, change, particularly when it comes to goals, which represents the vision of the community. We try not to change it. But the way this, I, I would imagine, is meaning that you are building, just like you said, building housing where jobs are and also could be mixed use development if there is um, 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 opportunities for that, but also building housing that is um, appropriate for the job levels, um, uh, the wage levels that you're offering in your community. If you said all of that here, I would understand what a goal was. Hmm. Okay, why don't we um, revise that? Because um, I, I try to, again, respect what is currently in the housing element and, and not change the goals. Um, but. I'll confess to being dense, but um, I'm having trouble. Uh, anyone else have anything on 68 or 69? How about 70? There's um, an objective and timeline at the bottom of 69, ongoing monitoring of the city's affordable housing inventory, currently at 162. Now page 62 says 192. So which number is right? This we'll is double check on that. Where are you, Steve? Where's... Top of page 70. Mm -hmm. It talks, it runs from the bottom of 69 up to 70. Mm -hmm. Talks about the current, the, the affordable housing inventory currently of 162 units. Page 62 says the current inventory no, it doesn't say what the current inventory is. I don't know where the number came from. Anyway, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, no, uh, it's anything another that meaningless happens, number. Yeah, we'll double we'll double check on that. But I think the the current inventory is one hundred and sixty two units. Okay, um, we're gonna ch we're gonna check on that six or seven unit building at uh, Grand and <coughs> I think it was or something. What was that? Okay. Um, where it talks about the middle of that page, increase the supply of accessory dwelling units. Uh, it talks about new ADUs and it talks about compliance. And that's good because there are those two categories. Um, new, in, new includes newly built and as well as conversions. I don't see anything about conversions in here. I don't recall it. Um, the other thing is that the ADU compliance program does not affect the supply of housing. Those are places where people are already living and making, changing something from illegal non-compliant to legal non-compliant is a good thing. I'm all in favor, but it doesn't change the amount of available housing because there's already somebody living there. Are we sure about that? Because I think the, the in some cases the data is that it's non-compliant. They want to bring it into compliance. And 
Oh, if they bring it, if they bring it to compliance and it's not currently being occupied, Correct. do we do we have that kind of statistic? I I don't know. I mean that that, that statistic. Uh, yeah. Bottom line, though, um, under um, um, you know we don't have to count them, but Rena does allow you to count it because um, the. The state does allow cities to count units that were not permitted and become a um, safe and sound housing unit and permitted. So you do um, increase the number of built um, units uh, that is considered a dwelling unit under the state's um, definition. So, right. And I'm agreeing. It helps with yeah. RENA numbers. It doesn't necessarily help with housing. So you're That's saying true. the physical number versus the statistical number is what we're talking about here, right? And this, um, page 71, it recommends establishing a period of participation. This is the compliance program in multiple phases of at least two years. I'm not understanding how that is different from just open season and no time limit on when. I think right now there is a sunset clause in the current compliance program, right? Yes, it's 2023. 2023, okay. After 2023, what happens if there is a unit that could have been in the compliance program, it's being rented, but it's not being reported to the city? Is there any consequence? From a, from a statistical standpoint, it's not being counted. From a legal standpoint, it's, it's illegal, meaning it, it's not currently or identified as being a unit that complies with both building and planning. I agree, I agree. Right. Does, that, does, does the city care? Well, through the compliance program, I, I would say yes. We're looking for these units to be in compliance. The, the Not a lot of cities have this. Allows the cities, to, the, the the units, to become legal non-compliant. Yeah, because they become they become legal non-conforming. Non-conforming, excuse me. Right. Right. Um, but what if what if there are units out there that people choose not to enter into the compliance program? I've heard very large numbers, and I don't know whether they're true or not. Of how many unreported ADUs there are around the city. What is, is there any consequence to having a non-conforming ADU and not reporting it? The consequence would be if someone was to complain, co-compliance would then get involved. Okay, that's the con that's and the if somebody wanted to sell the property there might be a disclosure of a second dwelling on the property, or right. might not. Right, and it could be the disclosure is as is. Okay. It just, uh, a part, period of participation in multiple phases of at least two years seems to me like an, an unending program with, with no consequences for noncompliance. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's what the city council intends or, or if they will simply pass a succession of ordinances with sunset clauses. That's a great question. I think that's reviewed as the sunset clause nears. I think they start looking at the data. So, uh, I mean, the most recent one that was just renewed, we were looking at the data from... It was like another two-year period. Correct. Yeah. So it's always, it, it fits, if it's being productive, then it, I mean, council seeing that it makes sense for it to be continued. Yeah, and we've gotten, what, in the teens, something like that, numbers of units mm, yeah. that are brought into compliance. On an annual basis. Become legal non-conforming. Right. Okay, do you, have, do you have a sense of how many others that <laughs> could be in the compliance program but are not? I, I don't. It, it does seem like there is a, I've heard lofty numbers in terms of one. I have too, and I don't know if they're true. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I just know that we have that, that program out there, and if there are individuals out there interested in getting in and compliance. 
we, we look at that on a case by case basis. Okay. Any other commissioners have questions? I'm, I'm looking at 76, 77. Uh, I'm not sure what project based tenant assistance is. That's in H6 on page 76. I know all those words strung together that way. It doesn't mean anything to me. Um, I have a, I'm sorry. Is this, is this a rental subsidy? Are we talking about program number five? Policy H6, last line. Policy, okay, I thought it was program. If, 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 that, if that phrase means something to somebody in the business, then I'll drop it. I don't know, it doesn't mean anything to me. Project-based rental assistance, a lot of times it would be um, the housing authority, that's usually um, provided by the housing authority. Uh, housing choice vouchers, like Section 8 vouchers, are uh, tenant-based, but then there are pro um, housing developments that the entire development may have specifically a contracted number of units that would, uh, that would provide Section 8 assistance. That's a project-based um, uh, Section 8 assistance. Okay, so it's a rent subsidy. Right. Okay. Um, I have a... I have a oh. Please go ahead. No, after you're after you're done, Steve. I just want to go back to the goal. I have a I have a question on page seventy five. The goal. Okay, which goal number two? My page number is a little bit off. So oh, is it oh yeah, goal number two. Okay. I mean, I, you, I, you have talked about this. Um, so the goal is to provide a continuing supply of affordable housing to meet the needs of existing and future Ojai residents in all income categories. And I, I don't know, this is just my opinion, I guess. I, you know, for Ojai, I see the biggest need with affordable housing for extremely, extremely low and very low income, because those are the, those are workers. Those are people that can't, can't afford to live here at all in any, in, in anything. And we need, we need, we need those opportunities, <coughs> excuse me, particularly. And so, but you had said, we can't really, it's not a good idea to change goals, but Oh, um, no, it's are, not, it's not you, that you can change your goals. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, we're really, so when, so what do I want to say? Um, I mean, so the state is saying you, you are going to provide housing opportunities for all across all incomes, even if a community thinks, well, we really have a problem at the low end. And, and when affordable stuff gets built, it tends to be built at the high, to provide for the high end. And nobody, <clears throat> nobody ever much addresses the lowest income levels. And, you know, I, I, I mean, no, I, I think this is a policy, this is a policy issue. And, and, you know, I'm just, I'm just one person, but, um, I don't know. I, I just really see a problem that that's the where we don't anywhere we don't anywhere say we really want to encourage the the low end of the scale in terms of housing opportunities. It's actually in policy uh, four um, that we emphasize the extremely low income, um, the lower income and the extremely low income and those with special needs. Oh, wait, wait, wait. policy. For policy H four, you could right you up, could right see right in the through. in the oh, fifth H3. cycle the the uh, amount of very low 
and low income available housing was zero. Show adopt policies, programs, and procedures. To um, but it's not the city's okay. responsibility. It's no individual parcel owner's responsibility to develop that housing. It is the city's responsibility to make it possible to develop that housing if somebody else can see a financial way clear to do it, period. I think the goal is extremely aspirational. I also think it's appropriate. I also think it's impractical, but it's what the city can do. And that's provide a framework in which it is possible if somebody wants to build this stuff that they can build it. Right. No, I, I, I completely agree, Steve. And I, so, I mean, you know, if the policy programs and procedures, it needs to be, so it will be developed. It's to be developed in the future and it needs to be specific and have creative ideas about how to accomplish this facilitating the attainment of the goals with the lower income, such as, um, use the housing fund money to buy land and then go into a public private partnership or I mean, whatever. It, it, anyway, I'm glad to see I'm glad to see it here. I didn't see that before. So thank you. Yeah, I'm glad to see the goal. I, I have to agree in in this world, even if we hadn't had the COVID and the shortage of city funds, it would likely still not be practical to buy land and go into a private public partnership to develop this. But there's nothing in the city's rules that says it can't be done. Exactly. And that's, I think, as far as the housing element can go. Um, on on uh, page 77, it talks about the second bullet, analyzing development pro formas. What is that? Is that standard plans for housing? Or what are development pro formas? It's That's certainly um, uh, what the city currently offers as uh, could offer as um, affordable housing assistance instead of uh, financing. But um, performers are when they uh, look at how, you know, whether it pencils out and city can evaluate, help evaluate it and looking at your fees um, situation, whether the numbers are correct and 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 help identify whether there are gaps in financing. But that's, um, you know, I the, see the, the gap financing at the end of the sentence. Sentence. Right. The development pro formas. Are you talking about legislative pro forma? No, financial pro formas. Okay. Uh, what? Do, how? How does? I'm sorry, Steve. This this may mean, and I've and this is something that comes up in development agreements a lot. Is uh, when um, there is, say, for example, a project being built and the, um, the developer who's building affordable housing units has a financial pro forma of what, what they have on hand and what the gap financing they need, say, in the form of, say, a matching grant from the state. And so the pro forma is simply what their build out is. And so it's a, it's a commonly used industry term. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it comes up a lot in development agreements. Um, the, uh, the next bullet how does the city that says the city's contribution can take a number of forms one is fast tracking the environmental review does the city do the environmental review does someone else do it how does the city fast track an environmental review i understand you could there there must be ways to fast track an entitlement permit process I think you're already doing some of that, but how do you fast track an environmental review? You put more people on it? You... <laughs> right, so the, the, the way in which the city and through our code um, currently does that is through a zone clearance. Um, through that zone clearance, there are a number of um, technical responsibilities, mitigation, if you will. Um, and all of, I would say, a majority of the aspects that are already derived within the, the CEQA document itself. So it's pulling those aspects, folding them into 
the municipal code, code itself. And that is, that is effectively fast tracking your environmental review and effectively the process itself. Okay. If, if that development meets every single aspect. Sure, sure. Otherwise you have to say mother may I to the planning commission or somebody. To review authority, yes. Yeah. And then, and then uh, as a caveat to that, there's also, for example, there is a CEQA exemption when a project, say, complies with all the policies in, of the general plan and specific plan. And so when we write our general plan and specific plan to include certain things, um, we basically create that CEQA exemption. And so that'll fast track it so they don't have to go through, say, the EIR process because they're okay, consistent. Okay, by finding, by finding bases for exemption. Right, exactly, because okay. it's consistent with our plans. Okay. Yep. Uh, any other commissioners? I'm on to page 78. Steve, I have, I have one question on 77. The bullet yes, ma'am. The bullet point after um, the one you just uh, brought up about environmental review, the next one says, Use, utilizing the city's police powers to provide appropriate land use and zoning. Could somebody explain that to me? I, th I think it means the city's legislative power, but... So, it might sound better than police power. It sounds forceful. Well, um, the police power is actually a term of art. So uh, as a city, okay. as a general law city, we have police power. And I, I, it, okay. it's, it's a, I guess it's sort of a misnomer because we, you know, we don't even have police. Um, it doesn't have, involve the police exactly. necessarily, but it it's, means you can set the rules and enforce them. Correct. So our police power would, say, involve, say, a zone clearance or something like that. And it's just our... The police power is uh, the term that comes from the California Constitution. And so it's the Article 12 of the California Constitution that gives the, it's local control. And so um, local control, the way we express local control is exercise of our police power. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. No, no problem. We're all learning a lot of terms of art as we go here, I think. Yeah, I didn't know that one. Um, okay. I have a question on page 78, the paragraph that begins resource development and it says the city the city shall and it's item three i i i actually it looks like there's two with i i i but it says assist with site identification and support application for funding for farm worker housing such as the Joe Cerna Jr. Farm Worker Housing Grant Program. And my question would be, how practical or even necessary is this item in the housing element? How much agricultural land is there in the city and how much farm worker housing is needed? I'd say almost zero and zero, respectively. Zero in terms of the amount that's within, I mean, I wouldn't say zero, but the number is close to zero. Um, there are some areas that have trees, right? Uh, fruit trees to some degree. Uh, may not necessarily be zoned for agriculture. In the city? Yes. Okay. However, however, I think the other, the other piece that you've got to be thinking about is providing that that farm work or farm workforce housing when we have, I would say to a certain degree, green belt directly around the city itself. So it's, it may not be directly within the city, but you're providing that opportunity for individuals at the doorstep of where they're working. You're talking about providing a framework for developing farm worker housing outside the city limits? No, inside. Inside the city limits. But they may work okay. right outside the city limits. Well, I, that you don't yeah, need yeah okay. Um, if that makes and, any and sense. We are actually this time for um, the review that we've done um, in San Diego County. Um, the state has been specifically uh, requesting cities to look at when it comes to farm worker housing and farm workers, not just um, whether you have farm workers in your city, but you're located in a farm um, um, agricultural rich um, kind of um, region, then you should consider that as well. Okay. It's nice language that may or may not apply. Um, okay, uh, public outreach 
talks, uh, the, this is the very bottom of page 78, talks about uh, assess housing performance, uh, contact, conduct a noticed meeting to assess housing performance every year in connection with the planning report required by California Government Code 65400. Has the City Council ever done that? Do you know? I'm not aware of, of the fact that we've done that recently. Yeah. We may have done that the first couple of years, but I haven't seen it done recently. I'm, uh, and there it is, the city shall again, so. So, uh, um, on, on that one. The annual progress report, right? I mean, we do have the APR, but I think right. they're. We're required to do says, that. And conduct a noticed meeting to assess housing performance. So, so um, Chair Quilsey, I, yes. one, one of the ways I think this gets done is the, this by state law, government code section 65400, we are required to have an, uh, an annual plan, a report, progress report. Usually it's done as the council adopts the findings of that report at a, at a, pub, at a meeting. Oh, that's at a, a good point. Point. As a consent item. As a consent item. So technically it is a notice meeting. Receive and file. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That so, makes and sense. it takes place at a noticed meeting. Correct. Ah, there, it doesn't, okay. The law doesn't require a standalone meeting, and it would be impractical for a city council to simply have a standalone meeting on just that very report. Some city councils do. Um, of larger cities, they may have a subcommittee hearing on that that recommends it to the full full council, but I believe it's the practice in most councils to adopt this by consent, and there is public comment on this. Okay. So that fulfills the criteria of this statute. Okay. Anybody? Page 79, page 80. I have a question on, a couple of questions on 81. Um, under item 7, capacity preservation. It says requiring the payment of in lieu fees based on an inclusionary housing factor of 15%. I went through my copy of the code online and I looked for inclusionary housing. Not there. What does that mean? What are we recommending that the city council submit? My understanding, this is an existing policy. It's not, um, like, this is not new. What, what is inclusionary housing? Um, and Lucas, if you, um, the way I understand it is that this is a program where you want the developers to build at a certain level that you are, um, you, you've planned for, uh, but you don't want them to downzone the properties. And if they do downzone it, then they have to pay an in lieu fee, assuming that 15% of the housing would be affordable. So I think that actually is through. <laughs> the reason why you may not have heard about this is because it's through the, uh, the SPL overlay. So if it is developed and it's not developed to the percentage that that's been estimated, that there could potentially be in lieu fee associated with that. We don't have an in lieu fee or an inclusionary housing ordinance per se within our code. Um, it's not a standalone like what you have with a density bonus. Um, understand, I still don't understand what inclusionary housing is. Inclusionary housing is basically requiring you to provide a certain percentage of housing. Inclusionary housing ordinance affordable. mandates that. Affordable, yeah. affordable okay. housing. Oh, did I? Yeah, affordable housing. I think that's a key term to, to identify here. Yes, affordable housing. That's different from inclusionary housing. No, inclusionary housing is affordable housing. So the terms are interchangeable. Yes. The only, the only difference is, is the percentage in terms of how you address that. And I think that is this is the, the application of this is very rare the way I see it. I haven't seen too many jurisdictions have something like that. When I saw that, I thought this was pretty interesting. Usually inclusionary housing applies to new development. When you have a development that is uh, 20 units um, and, and you have an inclusionary factor of 15, then you, you have to provide three units that is affordable that's inclusionary in, in a normal um, application. 
What your policy is actually saying is you're not requiring them to do that. You're only requiring them to pay a fee in lieu of that if you if they down zone the properties and not build at the density or or capacity you have anticipated in the in the SPL. Okay, what is down zoning? I'm yeah, I am very concerned about this policy <laughs> because well. I don't you know, know if I'm happy with it or not happy with it. I don't understand it. <laughs> well, so we have these SPL sites with a development potential of like 400 plus units. Well, it's 20, so, 20 per acre, I think, is the is the number they throw around. Well, it was in the it was in the administrative report. It's over 400 units development potential for all the SPL sites. So, uh, in fact, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask tonight. So, if we have these SPL sites and they all have a maximum development potential, how much of a box are we in to, to make sure that if there's any development there, that it's built at the maximum level? I mean, if, we, you know, so, so the only way we get affordable housing, well, is if we so if we don't build so if we don't allow them to build to the maximum um this is what happens with <laughs> um actually um i did not estimate the spl at the maximum density um if you look at the actual calculation of the properties i think i use um i believe i use 14 or 16 units to the acre i 14, didn't 70%, i didn't assume everybody yes. did Pardon? You used 70%, 14 units per 14 acre. Units. That's what I thought. I used 14% um, of, of the maximum, assuming that, you know, not everybody comes in with the with the maximum development stand, uh, like, you know, density. Exactly how this policy is applied, I must say, I don't know. I haven't seen it before. I've never seen a policy like that before in other jurisdictions. So how how is that being applied in the past? I don't know. Um, and, and, and it's not in your policy. Um, it's not in your code. Um, it's up to the city whether you think this is this should be removed. But the, the idea is assuming, you know, like how we, how you're going to um, um, implement it is entirely up to you. But assuming that I asked, uh, there's a one acre site and we estimated 14 units to, um, that it could go 14 units. And they come in and say, no, nah, we're going to only build eight units. Then they are down zoning it to some extent. They're giving you fewer units than you have anticipated. So then that's when would, according to the way I read this, this program, then they would be um, assessed a, a, an in lieu fee. An in lieu fee, okay. yeah. Let me see uh, if I can, well, let, me, let me use an example just, just quickly here. Like let's say for instance, there is an existing housing development and it's eight units. Let's just say it's eight units and they come back it's in the VMU and they want to convert four of those units into work live, right? Or let's just, let's make it even simpler. They want to make it commercial. So we're losing four units on site, right? The way this reads, the capacity preservation, you're lo we're losing four units. So by losing four units, there's an in lieu fee that then comes into play so that we can use that money. So if somebody promised to build four affordable units and they didn't, then they have to pay a 15% penalty. That's I'm, the way I'm, I'm looking What's at the, I'm looking at the code online right now. And I searched on inclusionary and it comes in back in 10 to 902 definitions. It's not there. 102901 purpose of article. It talks about inclusionary zoning. Still doesn't define inclusionary. 102906 talks about inclusionary differential and inclusionary percentages, but doesn't define them. Right. I'm lost. 
So an inclusionary housing ordinance is usually what it means is it's a set aside. And so when you have an inclusionary housing ordinance, you're basically requiring it, like uh, the consultant said, it applies to new development. And so, for example, if a new pr development is approved with 100 units, the inclusionary ordinance says that 15 percent of the, those units must be affordable. Okay, except we don't have an inclusionary ordinance. We don't have an inclusionary ordinance, but the way the term inclusionary gets used is that inclu it includes affordable housing in whatever is being developed. So that's that's where the term inclusionary comes in. So they're not necessarily synonymous, but it's inclusionary is a signal that affordable housing must be included along with whatever is being developed. And we use kind of the same way, the, the, the language the same way. Mm. Okay, but there is nothing, it says the city will continue to enforce the zoning ordinance that existing residential development potential be preserved by prohibiting down zoning, whatever that means, can't find that, or requiring the payment of an in lieu fee. So, um, but it doesn't even say SPL or anything in there. Continue to implement the capacity preservation requirement. That's the objective. With um, but I, none of that's in the code anywhere. So what is it that we're preserving or enforcing? I don't understand what this paragraph is about. I think the title does, does it justice. Capacity preservation. So existing capacity preservation. So if there is replacement housing like 10-2.904, I don't think it, it, it's apples to apples in terms of how this program is, is identified, how it, how it sprinkles itself throughout, um, throughout the code itself. I think it's definitely with, within, I think this, the spirit of what we're looking at here is within um, Article 9. I think there's there's definitely a possibility and an opportunity um, with this program to tease out that information further, potentially clarify it as a part of the the zoning um, updates that would take place after this housing element is um, adopted. Okay, on, if on, if we were to update a part, if we were to modify or recommend modifying a part of Title Ten to comply with this, what would we be doing? Excellent question. I, that I would, just, ha that would have to be looked at deeper. What it is, I don't understand what the activity is that is described here that would or would not involve an in lieu payment of 15%. And it's 15% of what? Uh, it, it, the whole thing is very unclear to me, and I'm uncomfortable recommending that the City Council submit it. It was maybe, submitted. As maybe a, all these words mean something to HCD already. Yeah, so it was submitted as a part of the fifth cycle. This isn't necessarily a new program that's being implemented. It's it's being. I see it's in black type. Yeah, it's being further analyzed through the objectives and the timeline itself. But the reality is, is that if there are pieces to that puzzle that need to be further clarified through that program, and that's something that HCD, when it goes to HCD, and they say yeah, we absolutely love this program in terms of what you're proposing. Or they say, throw this program out. Well, if inclusionary housing factor of 15% was apparently approved by HCD or at least not objected to right. by HCD the last time around, it just doesn't mean anything as far well, as I can tell. Is that being used um, recently? Say that again? Has this policy or this program been... Um, used uh, or implemented before on a, on a particular project? I can't think of one off the top of my head right now. No. Was it, was it used for the, um, any, that uh, project that was related to development at the end? For affordable housing? One years ago? Uh, that was that. I mean, I'm just curious. I mean, th that would be the only project that I could think. I mean, it was did it was a project that never happened. What about uh, Mallory Way? Did Ma didn't Mallory Way have inclusionary? Um, Mallory Way is a little bit different than that because different. it's it's actually part of the fourth cycle. If you're looking yeah. at it from yeah. from when it would have gone forward, and it's now now part of a new project. Correct. Now it's subject to a development agreement, and so. Well. 
we hope. Well, for wow. this policy, I mean, I I don't person I don't mind the concept of an in lieu fee instead of um, instead of some development, but I I I don't like the implication of not somehow not um, not allowing the maximum density on a site. You know, I. I Oh, I didn't see sure that. I'm not sure that's very there. workable with OI. I don't know what's in there. They just made the choice to prohibit downzoning. What is what is downzoning, Lucas? That's when you're that's when you're taking like for instance a, a density that allows maybe one, maybe eight units to the acre, and instead you're downzoning it to or effectively not building to the maximum capacity. Yeah, I don't like the implication of that. It feels like we're getting put in a box. Uh, I mean, the offering an in lieu fee option in some in some way is it might be workable, but 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 saying you know we have to we have to approve full development or else I don't know about that. I mean, there's pros and cons to it. I mean, the reality is is there are pros and cons to most of this programs we're looking yeah. at here. The, the pro is, is that we gain control through in lieu fees, tease that information out even maybe even further through revisions to the code. So if there's if there's somebody that wants to build on an R X parcel where the maximum density is eight units per acre and they have an acre and they put in a proposal to build six units on that acre instead of the eight units that they could build, then they have to pay 15%? Correct. Because, that's, because they didn't build eight units? That's the way that I'm saying this, yes. Capacity preservation. Yep. Is that in the code somewhere? I, I don't necessarily see it expressly in here. I can't find but I, inclusionary, but I think inclusionary housing in think, the code. I think the spirit of it is in here. I think it could be teased out further through revisions. Um, what if we add, like, rewrite this a little bit? That the current the city has a current um, policy. Um, it may not be in the code, but it has a current policy to do this. Um, as part of the comprehensive zoning code update following the general plan, the city will review this one and and either further either clarify it and or make it more effective or however you want to to say it. But but then building the uh, objective is not to continue to implement the um, capacity preservation requirement, but to to reveal and uh, that doing the code update and make sure that is is an effective um, and appropriate policy. I think further clarifying would be would be helpful in, in this scenario. Would, yeah. Okay. But ju just so I understand completely, if somebody comes in and wants to build four units in an area where eight is permissible, the city would say, yeah, you can have a permit for four units, but it's going to cost you not to build those other four units. I mean, that's the way that I'm reading this cap capacity preservation currently. Yeah. Except I can't find it in the code anywhere. Right. If there were an inclusionary housing ordinance, that's the sort of thing it would say? Yes. And then in addition to that, there would be an affordable housing agreement that would ensure that that's done. Okay. Uh, yeah, on, can I just ask a question? It, um, since the consultant is here tonight, um, so so how how much are so with these SPL overlay sites that do have a development potential of you know X units? Um, how tightly are we held to that? Uh, expectation of building the maximum number of units on that site. How much discretion does the city have in terms um, of evaluating the neighborhood? You know, what kind of density is around it? Um, you know, the, the, the resource um, consumption and 
and other impacts to establish a density that might be less than the, the maximum or even less than the 70 percent? Um, there are a couple of things um, in play. The uh, one I did not anticipate um, of building everything um, at the maximum, like you know, I mentioned it, I use 70 percent. Um, right. So average is that. Um, but you you do have the Housing Accountability Act. If it's an affordable housing project, you have limited uh, ability to to change the density and compel them to go lower density. Um, I think in there there you have to have objective standards um, to evaluate all of these um, criteria. But a lot of the times, what we see. The reason why I actually use uh, 14 units um, um, to the acre instead of um, um, higher in most communities, I would use 80% or even 85% of the maximum. But the reason why I use 70% in your community is just understanding that one, um, you you have more, You it's not a uh, typical um, um, area where people would come in and build relatively high density. And even for um, market rate housing, people are not likely to build very high density. And, and that, you know, certainly there are more constraints um, potentially on your properties um, uh, being a relatively rural area. Um, so that's the reason why I, I use 70% instead of uh, a higher uh, percentage if you're in a more urbanized um, area. But um, there are state laws that requires that you use objective standards to evaluate projects. There are um, state laws that um, require you to um, that prohibit um, you from um, like compelling a developer to go lower density if the, the if the if the if the I guess the the, um, uh, the conditions are not objective. Okay, so I mean, so the expectation really is um, the seventy percent that the city would need to allow that seventy percent. Of density, you know, have to allow for for twenty units to the acre. If a development comes in and they meet all your standards, they meet all your criteria, and there are no like no constraints, and they actually show you a project that they can meet that twenty units to the acre, then that's what you you would have to do. But what my assumption is that a lot of projects probably could not do that because of constraints. Okay. Okay. I understand. I'm not, <laughs> I don't think I'm happy, but I understand. Yeah, I know, um, you know, it, 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 our hands are pretty tied um, um, and, and increasingly tied um, with, uh, with state laws. Um, I, I, I don't even want to know what are the new laws that they're considering and passing in the next um, session, so. Oh, Chair, I remain, um, I remain confused. Let's see. What do you think about continuing the item? <laughs> think about what? What do you think about continuing this item to the next meeting? I'm ready to. I'm ready to quit for now. I'm up to page eighty-five. I think that's a great idea. Well, I'd be happy to entertain okay. a motion to continue the item to July 7th. So moved. A second. Okay, um, Cheryl has stepped away. Um, I'll, I'll do roll call. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Vice Chair Nolan? Yes. Commissioner Swift? Yes. Commissioner Trent? Yes. Commissioner Lottis? Yes. Chair Colsey? Yes. 5 0. All right. Um, let's, let's very swiftly move to item three tentative agenda, July 7th formula business ordinance. 
and general plan land use discussion. And I guess we'll add the last 15 pages or so of this thing to it. And I would, I would uh, solicit the help from all the commissioners. I'm going to work on it tomorrow, I guess, to uh, either make a copy of notes that you've made in your, in your packet or write out changes and questions and send them all to Lucas. Yes, and not only that, but I know we're starting, we'd be starting on eight, page 85, but if you have notes for the entire document itself, I would just, I, I would say make copies of that and send it to me. Yeah, if you, we'll if you those, go to the city website and pull up the agenda with this link, this linked item, you'll get a PDF, I think, and you can search through it and you can find stuff that way and make notes or whatever it is you want to do. Or just write on your hard copy and make a copy of it and send it, get it back to Lucas. Yep, either is okay. What's the latest we can get those turned in? I'm not going to be able to do it tomorrow or the next day. Well, it's three weeks till the next meeting. Oh, okay. But, uh, so I, I, would, I, I, would, I would say in the next seven days, try to get that to yeah. you. Okay. Urge, urge you. you to do it as quickly as you can. You need to. Okay. Um, so July 7th, formula business ordinance and general plan land use discussion. Oh, what other, what other elements of the general plan are we going to be involved in besides whatever this one's called? The oh housing God, elements. I'm losing it. The housing elements. Housing, housing, land use. Environmental justice element. Uh, circulation. Circulation, yes. The environmental justice element, which is okay. Has that mm. been drafted? No, we are we are a ways from that being drafted. We need to get through some of these other bigger pieces, like the vision and guiding principles. Okay. But they don't they don't have the same deadline for submission to a state agency. That no, this one does. This one has state requirements in terms of of deadlines. Where the housing element, or not the housing element, just the general plan itself. Typically, you're wanting to update that every 20 to 25 years. Okay. Typically, but, but the housing the, element is on a separate cycle. Right, and, right. And I understand. So, so there, there's a deadline for getting the housing element right. review done. We, we is there a deadline for any of the rest? No, not really. We are in the process of updating our general plan, um, but some cities, for example, are not updating their general plan and only updating their housing element. I've, the council's decided that now is the time to update. That's the all they have plan. the stomach for. Yes. Yes. I understand. Yeah, and so I think once I don't recall the last time the general plan was updated for the city, but it's in different phases. I mean, we're talking phase. 89, 90, 90, 98. Yeah, I know. There. Well, you can you can just read through the code, right? And read through the general plan, and so see that some of that stuff is more than 30 years old. The full GP update is what the city is currently in the process, and the what we're under the I guess prefer, what we're under the gun is H the uh, housing element. Housing element, sure. Because there's a separate state agency HCD that has authority over that. I I recall I think asking somebody from Rainey Whitmore, was that his name, Ron Whitmore? Yes, Ron. Um, how much of the general plan they were updating and he said not all of it right so we're doing deeper dives on certain pieces and then we're doing soft touch on others okay so we're going to be involved in housing land use circulation and environmental justice maybe some other stuff those seem like the big those are the big ones i'm trying to they remember the uh, i think there's one more i'm just not remembering Safety element, yes, that's correct. Safety, okay. Yep. So any questions for staff on the Planning Commission tentative agenda? All right. Um, one more item on the agenda is, future, is uh, commission member reports. Any commissioners have something of potential interest you'd like to report? I have one item myself. I've heard really good um, comments from the from 
various people in the community about the Thursday e evening uh, farmer's market, saying they, it was fabulous and they like loved it. it. Well, good. Now, if we can find a way to make it legal. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. Very good. I, yeah, I didn't get over there. That's again tomorrow night though, huh? That's three, right. three to seven, I think on Thursdays. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, I wanted to report there is an Ojai Valley Municipal Area Council OV Mac meeting next Monday. They have as a standing item on their agenda, a report from the Ojai Planning Commission. I have been attending and providing reports which were just a brief summary of the things that the Planning Commission did in its last meetings, last typically last two meetings since the previous OV Mac meeting. Next Monday, I have, uh, the distinct pleasure and honor of chairing a special meeting of the Ojai Valley Sanitary District Board, so I can't go to the OV Mac meeting. I did provide, Sherry has, and uh, Maruha Clense from Commissioner Lapeer's, is it Lapeer? Lapeer. Oh, wait, you're talking about the supervisor? Supervisor Lapeer. Lapeer. Uh, supervisor Lapeer's office. She runs the MAC meetings. Anyway, I have given her a two or three sentence summary in lieu of anyone appearing, but they really would love to have somebody show up. So if one of the other commissioners can do that, please let Sherry know, and she will let Maruha know, and they will expect you. They'll send you a Zoom link to the meeting, I presume. I would do it, but I have a I have a commitment. But I'll, I'll do it. Um, I'll do it the next time after that, Steve. Okay. Yeah, they meet uh, typically on the third third Monday, I think. Mm -hmm. And this is an out of cycle meeting for me, but it has to be done because certain budget things have to be done and submitted to the county before the first of July. And having a meeting on the twenty eighth of June doesn't give them time to get the work done. Uh, item five, city council liaison. Um, we're not gonna have one tonight. Anything else that anyone wants to bring up? Again, I- I, I have one point to bring up. Oh, tonight, please go ahead, could. Lucas. Just backing up to commission member reports, um, just kind of teasing in some information. So as you can see, there are members of this commission that are here and live. Uh, as well as staff um, and and legal counsel, I would I would say that this is the start of a transition to um, to the commission being in person again. I I would I would say that the the state recently released information identifying that really by September 30th um, in person meetings I think that's kind of the goal, but we're looking at a slow transition. To, to seeing that. So just know that um, we're being cautious in terms of how we're rolling this out. The so. change is coming. For, for those of you that are, that are Zooming in tonight, you may or may not be able to tell from, from the view that you have inside the city council chambers here, but there are little uh, plexiglass type barriers sitting between each of the seats on on the dais here it's uh it's different <laughs> it is definitely different i i can't i can't argue with that it's a new it's a new normal as we transition yeah but the public is also invited in so but socially distanced. oh yes and there's a there's a big barrier at at the lectern so that uh, people who come to speak to us and we had two live tonight they're they're speaking from behind some sort of a screen and Cheryl is all barricaded in there in her desk. <laughs> so that's the way it's going to be for a while, I guess, folks. And uh, encourage you to come on back if you can. I found zooming in to be really convenient. I could do it 
from just down the street or from Austin, Texas or Dallas or Glenwood Springs, Colorado. If there's one thing Zoom has Very taught us fun. is that the convenience factor is definitely there from wherever you're at. Yeah, but when, when that transition completes, then the meeting of a Brown Act body is going to change again to require that if you call in remotely, as this is what, I'm be, what I've been told, that you must declare wherever you are zooming in from to be a public space and the public is invited in to join you because it's a Brown Act body, right? And uh, that's correct, except for there's a bill pending in the legislature that would uh, change that law to allow people to zoom in without uh, opening their their public space to the public. Ah, okay. Their space to the public, uh, in recognition that the uh, we we've been doing this for a while and it hasn't the world hasn't collapsed. So, <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Any comebacks from commissioners or staff? Oh, and that's, uh, as that's always, great. I thank you all for your work, and I declare the meeting adjourned at 1021.